I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Council Member Content here. Evelyn Baker here. Carol here. Happy. Keller here. Miller here. Mayor Bell here. Okay. Addition or amendments to the agenda. If we could move seven B up between three, right after three. Any other additions or amendments? Yeah, Would you like to be moved up? Okay. Well, then he loves us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so we'll just move seven via. I did notice this morning, a typographical error. I put the wrong year for the minutes. Should be December 11th and December 13th, 2023. I got a little excited for the new year, apparently. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. It's fluffy. I see that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, adoption of consent agenda for the amendments. Good. Vote, vote. vote to approve the amended agenda. Roll call vote. Do we have a motion? Or is there a motion? I move to approve the amended agenda. I'm sorry. Roll call vote. Council Member Crompton. Aye. Everling Baker. Aye. Farrell. Aye. Keller. Aye. Miller. Aye. Mayor Bell. Aye. Aye. All right. Now we have to move on to adoption of consent agenda with the changes of the not 20, December 11th, yes. 23, yeah. December 13th, 23. A couple of changes is that actually second? Correct, yeah. There'll be this discussion. Motion. We need a motion. I move to approve the minutes of December 11th, 2023, the approval of minutes of December 13th, 2023, and the ratification of the bills in the amount of $485,695.22. I second. Okay. Discussion? Okay. Um, so on the December 11th, page four, uh, we have a CM Farrell said a resident asked if the town has a committee for hometown Christmas. The actually should be CM Farrell asked, to, asked said a resident asked if the town has a committee that organizes events like the hometown Christmas. And then um, other amendments for December 13th, I wasn't actually there, so my name needs to be removed off of um, who was present. Okay. Any other? I think it is excused. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but it also says that I was there. Just oh, yeah. oh, it's right. in both spots. So I was like, well, it can't be in both spots. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Unless you really want to. I have a motion to sign it with amendments. Marilyn, you have those amendments? Mm -hmm. okay. Roll we'll call vote. Councilmember Compton? Aye. Evelyn Baker? Aye. Farrell? Aye. Keller? Aye. Miller? Aye. Mayor Bell? Aye. Okay. We're going to move up not to the community college. Thank you for coming. Thank you. You can have access to the country. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. 
Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Lucy Sari. I'm the president of the Matthew Community College, and I want to thank you all for having us out tonight, and also thank you for rescheduling. We apologize for the, the last one we had to cancel back in November. I think it was still the things happened. Um, anyway, this, I think this is the first time the three of us have been out here, um, and so appreciate that. So I'll start with some introductions. It was that Lucy Sari is the Matthew Community College. Hi, good evening. Andrew's here. Uh, I'm the chair of the board, and I've been on the board for five years now. And I'm a alumnus of the college, and um, so it's a it's an neat honor to come back to the college and be on the board and serve the community in that way. Uh, I grew up in Sandy, and uh, I just I love the community college model, and so I this is really just an extension of like giving back to the community and just. Uh, Helping to get back to what I received from the college. So good to be with you tonight. And here. can you repeat your position again? I'm the board chair. Great. Yeah. And good evening. My name is Annette Matson. I am elected from the clerks in District 4, um, which is totally within the David Douglas School District in East Portland. I'm in my seventh year on the board. Like Andrew, I'm an alumni of the Community College and started back there. Oh, back in the 90s, when I was a 30-year-old working mom with two little girls, and decided that um, it was time to go back to school. Um, and um, I also served on the David Douglas School Board for 18 years. Education is truly my passion, because I know what a difference it makes in people's lives, to be able to, uh, to, be able to get a good job and have a good, ordinary life. So I would like to start this up by asking how many of you have ever taken a class at Mount Hood? Okay. okay. And for those of you who didn't raise your hand, you had a family member or friend that's taken a class at Mount Hood. So for anyone that hasn't raised their hand, have you ever swam in our pool or been to our pool? <laughs> <laughs> Those three questions I usually can um, get most hands raised. Um, part of it is because Mount Hood has been such a impact in this broader community, and so our district is about 950 square miles, um, but it's had a lot of impact and opportunities. We've been around since 1966, so we are heading towards our 16th year. Um, just a little bit about the college. Um, yeah. okay. We are about the third largest community college in Oregon. And it depends on the area. Um, when you look at students, um, we've got about 19,000 students that we serve annually. Um, 18 to 5. We're actually in Roman, so obviously we're quite happy about that. So that's um, the difference in the 500. I think one of the, the most rewarding things this year is there was an independent study that looked at community college, 158 community colleges across the country, and looked at affordability and quality of education. And out of those, not the community college ranked number four. Um, and again, this was across the U.S., um, something we're quite proud of. Um, this has been very important to the board members and the affordability piece and keeping it um, quality. And so, we're really pleased with that, and we are the highest ranked community college in Oregon. So um, we love to have that. A little some highlights about the college. Um, the college is equity minded, and part of this has to do with our student population. We're about 40% students of color. We also have this beautifully rich immigrant and refugee population um, that adds to that diversity. And as such, we have a lot of our programs that are supporting our students at all areas. Um, we are student-centered, and we like to call ourselves the career college um, of the area, and that's because 31% of our students are in some form of CTV programming, and that may not sound like a lot, but if you look at our sister institutions in the greater Portland area, um, we're more than double where they are. Some of this has to also do with our significant apprenticeship program. We serve about 6,000 apprentices annually through 25 of the different trade organizations. Um, and so it's it's both in our district and also we serve out of district. Um, 
And then career focus, we're really looking for quality jobs, family wage jobs for our students. Um, one of the things that's new is we were one of the first two programs in the state approved to excuse me, colleges to offer a applied baccalaureate degree. So there will be a four-year degree offered at Matthew Community College, and then we'll have our first graduate in class in 2026. Um, this will be in cybersecurity, which is a, a growing demand area. Um, and the nice thing is most of this program will be online. So for people that maybe can't get into Gresham, um, it's a great opportunity, it's a great job, it's in high demand. Um, and so for folks uh, here, for example, and um, we'll be a program they have access to. Um, also, um, you might have seen the big announcement last week of microchip receiving the Federal Chips Act. Um, we're a strong partner with them and do a lot of folks offering us electronic screening for their workforce, but also training and upskilling their incumbent workforce. Um, so we received two future and Oregon grants in support of that work. So that's a little bit of um, what's happening at the college, but these things don't just happen by chance. Um, it takes planning, it takes um, strategic planning, force by thought and sight, and um, that is where our board comes in because they set that direction for us. So I'd like to turn it over now to... Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, well, what we first of all, is our strategic planning process that we uh, went through. So our strategic plan involved a really robust community engagement process. We had feedback from community members, students, employees, partners, and stakeholders. And the goals of this process were, to first of all, make sure we had a transparent strategic plan process. And then to create a final product that was an expression of our values and who we really are as a college. And then, of course, develop an actionable plan with specific goals, and that would drive our planning, including our annual budgets. So it was a highly interactive and collaborative process. We had opportunities for input with interviews and focus groups, and we did surveys, and we did a half-day charrette. And the process collected honest and constructive feedback about issues and priorities related to mathood. We want to make sure we heard voices from the broad spectrum of our community. So the surveys were offered in seven different languages, and we held a focus group in Spanish and had translators available for our sessions. Community input came from focus groups within our school districts, elected officials, cities, our chambers of commerce, um, other entities like the Pacific Northwest Carpenters Institute, the Rosewood Initiative, and Programa El, 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 El Espanol. These groups helped us develop um, a survey and they shared our survey with their respective networks. Now, our new strategic plan addresses the needs of the changing student body and our district demographics. It responds to industry trends and it supports our employees so they can support our students. So what we heard over this was a lot of great feedback and we organized it into various themes. Now, in general, our students and staff feel safe at Mountain Community College, and they do feel the college is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Students ranked our academic programs, financial aid, and location as the college's top three strengths, while the availability of, cla availability of classes and technology were seen as our top two weaknesses. Now, keep in mind this process took place during the pandemic, so things like internet access were a really top priority for people. We also heard from community, community leaders that the college's relationship with our K-12 leaders, our business leaders, and our political leaders was on the weak side. So from all the data collected, eight key opportunities were identified for us. First, the built environment. It doesn't offer very many opportunities for, for um, social gatherings and for interaction. And coming out of COVID, people really wanted to connect with each other again. Second, our decision-making wasn't always seen as transparent. Our internal stakeholders want to understand how we make the decisions that further our goals. Third, it was sometimes hard to track student success, especially as it relates to better understanding what students need to be successful 
and particularly our students who are insecure in regard to their basic needs. <coughs> Fourth, many students are unaware of the services available to help them succeed. We need to consistently get information out to our students about these services. Fifth, the pathways from K-12 to Mountain Community College and beyond are not clearly spelled out. And the college needed to work better to inform parents and our first-generation college students. Sixth, our business partnerships vary in strength. Some are really strong, especially in our career and technical education programs. Yet other businesses thought we could do better to relate to them and to identify and respond to their needs. Seven, the needs of a highly diverse student body are not fully addressed, and the college should better leverage coordination between the college departments and services and our community-based organizations. And lastly, the community is not fully aware of what we have to offer. We need to do better at sharing what we're doing. The community is interested in being invited to our campus for events, and the community wants not the community college to show up as an active partner. And this feedback gives clarity in what we need to do to improve. Um, so I'll be just covering the plan the, and then the accountability around the plan. So um, all the data we collected and the process we used to develop our plan was centered on equity. And you'll see up on the slide the, the um, equity statement, vision, and mission statement. Um, but those were our guiding lights as we thought about moving into the execution and the creation of the plan itself. And then to address the opportunities we heard, the college focused uh, our work in the next five years to improve teaching and learning. So specific objectives include things like effective and inclusive teaching, improving assessment, and reducing overall course failure rate. Number two, provide a full range of programs and services to help students reach their specific goals. Uh, objectives include things like aligning programs and industry and community needs, assessing student needs, designing programs and services based on those needs. Number three, aligning colleges operations to address diversity of communities we serve. Specific objectives include things like using an equity lens in all decision-making, expanding our service our basic ser service needs support and seeking sources of revenue to support student success number four provide facilities and technologies to serve all students objectives include things like strengthening online learning and improving student and employee facing electronic systems including the website number five increasing our visibility in the community and strengthening relationships with community partners. Objectives include things like authentically engaging with historically excluded and multilingual communities, expanding work-based learning, and partnering with local organizations to create a community hub to exchange and share resources. And so next we'll cover accountability. So over the next four years, or four years from now, when you think of Mountain Community College, we don't expect that you'll know what we've done to our website, how teaching is different, or what systems we've changed. But we want you to feel as if the college is an integral part of the community uh, and a good investment of public resources. So to do this, the board has set indicators so that we can track our impact on community and hold ourselves accountable. Specifically, by 2027, we expect to see Number one, improve student success for all students, regardless of race, age, gender, or income. Specifically, our certificate and degree completion rates will increase to 53%. Our retention rates will increase to 75%. And 45% of students will complete at least 23 credits in their first year. Number two, 80% of students will meet core learning objectives for all students, regardless of race, age, gender, or income. Number three, 70% of residents will say that NHCC is a good steward of taxpayer dollars. Number four, 30% of our high school students from our district will attend Mountain Community College after graduation. Number five, 
employee diversity will reflect the dis our district diversity within five percentage points. Six, student diversity will exceed our district diversity by five percentage points because if we are successful in achieving our commitment to access equity, access and equity, our diverse communities will find the college's place they can, can succeed. The next, I'll turn over to Lisa. So that was just a really quick um, overview of what we did. Um, we've included links and QR code, and I actually have got two examples, not two examples, but two hard copies. Um, one is our strategic plan, as a lot of what we went over in more detail. The other is part of, we did a comprehensive environmental scan. So this has a lot of demographic information about our entire district, um, some of the um, or figures from your area included in here. Um, so I'll leave those um, if you want to look a little bit more. But we are excited. Um, we're about to release our annual update. Um, we mentioned, where Andrew mentioned the accountability measures. Mm -hmm. Every year we're going to be reporting on how we're doing um, and where we've had success and maybe some areas we're, we're working on. But that is our plan, um, and so we appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. And then I want to open up and see if you have any questions we can ask. Kathleen, I'm here. Hi, I, thank you for being here. And um, I understand that Cascade Knox is in the district of Mount Hood Community College, which honestly doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> Way further in Hood <laughs> County, <laughs> Hood Community College has campus in Hood River. So, are you doing any tracking of? of Cascade Lock students. Are you tar getting sending any targeted uh, information to Cascade Lock's families? And does this districting, and I apologize for not having done my research, go all the way to Wood River? No, or just so this right. is yes. Um so we have an interesting relationship with the school districts in that when Cascade Box had a school district, mm -hmm. um, that's how you ended up in Mount Hood service area. When the merger happened with Hood River, um, Hood River School District is in Columbia Gorgeous District. Right. And so um, based on some guidelines and whatnot, they're the primary communicators with the families with um, in the school district. And so I've worked closely with their president on um, what we do and how we do it, but that's been part of, I think, the challenge in serving you, but then also realizing that at least with high school students, it comes from Columbia Gorge. Hmm. But yes, I agree. It's interesting. Interesting. It is. Yes. Interesting. We're all perplexed on that. One. Yes. And it's, yeah. It's sort of like being in David Douglas and Park Rose, and we are right. part of the city of Portland due to annexation, but not part of PPS. But it's that, but we have the connection with Mount Hood Community College right. historically. It's a little, little not quite as strange as yeah. this one yeah. is different. <laughs> History. And you look at people do lines on maps. <laughs> and it's been like 40 years since I attended for over here. It's 41 years. But, um, I even question they had used to have a really good nursing program. Do you guys still have a nursing? We do. I did yes. not know that. Um, we have nursing. We also, in the health professions, we have um, dental hygienist, um, surgical tech, respiratory therapist, uh, uh, medical assistant, medical assistant, physical therapy assistant, uh, funeral science. Um, phlebotomy, and so there's like a whole range, and we're um, also our CNA program now has um, preferential points to getting into our nursing program. So we try to do, do that ladder into nursing. So I know nursing's a big, yeah, big name. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a professor for CSUN oh. education right now, and I taught at Oregon Trail School District, oh. so I'm quite familiar with Mount Hood Community College, and. My my question is: Are we getting any catalogs or anything to to share our our targeted? I understand it wouldn't help to send it to everybody mm -hmm. unless they were community classes, but um, I, we are small enough that our graduating senior class, uh, Councilman Keller, how many how many Cascade Lockians graduated year? I think teens, high teens. High teens, only about 20 families would be. And so, if you took, you know, eight, nine, or nine, 10, 11, 12, 
80 families in order to, to maintain a healthy relationship as we are district with you it seems that the community being aware of the wide range of your programs um, and pathways that would help you know because we do get the catalogs the mm -hmm. columbia gorge okay. catalogs in the mail box mm -hmm. and the population is growing we have many new homes 45 45, 45 new homes Great. in the process where they're just clearing the land and putting in all the and it really is so it's, it's we're growing mm -hmm. <laughs> The, the driving distance isn't that great. I mean, almost they're, equivalent. They're yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so really, I think, and when you mentioned the swimming pool, do our families even know what what's available to them? I don't know that many people know we are affiliated or in the district. No, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know how it's done right now with the school. Now we don't have the high school, but my son went to the high school here and he got a scholarship through you guys. So I know it was being advertised with the students at that time, but I'm not sure how it's done now. And I just uh, have a friend who just completed the nursing program. So thank you. And I will do a plug. Our foundation is amazing. In fact, this year I think there are over eight hundred thousand dollars in scholarships that are awarded. Really so, um, you know, all the kids in the area that are looking to go to college, um, have them check out our scholarships. There's a lot of them. We have some that go unawarded. I had a question about um, there's individuals in Cascade Blocks that did not graduate high school. And they'd like to get a GED. Is there possible to have satellite? programs out here for individuals that would like to get their GED? Because that could be, um, I think, a barrier mm -hmm. for them to complete it if they have to go to the college. But I didn't know if anything is online or oh. somehow we could support those individuals to get a GED. Let me look into that and find out what okay. some options could be for, because I'm sure this is the only area where we have right. this, um, right. so that would be good to know where. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you also have a need for ESL in the area? Denise, we might. Um, it, it, it hasn't been hugely apparent yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. My other question is, if we're in your district, does that also include um, community classes? Community instruction. Okay. And so, I suppose anybody could take them. Somebody from Portland could come, but this idea of satellite, <laughs> satellite classes, we have a big building. In there. <laughs> if you've ever thought about that, how many folks would it take to make it feasible? Um, you know, I know some folks that would like dance classes. <laughs> yes. Because we are severely lacking in community services here. So we're looking for more opportunities for um, constituents that have the opportunity to further education or education and dance classes or, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I think sometimes I mean, we're not that far from you, but the gorge and that distance can be a barrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as your community is growing too, with there's individuals that have skills. Sometimes what we lack is the part-time instructors or the instructors to do it. So that could also be something um, that we could partner on if there's someone that comes in or that's here. Um, so you need like a professor or a high school teacher? Doesn't have the same requirements, right? Right. Um, right. But, um, who would you contact for that? Um, start with me. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you. Sounds great. Any other questions or comment? Comment. Council's yeah. done. I, I so I put the same plug in Dr. Larson's ear. I noticed one of the medical fields that mentioned was the paramedic school, which they do not have as well. And our fire chief believes our fire station would be a great home. Or a joint program for the paramedics. Well, the part property next to us. Okay, the part property next to us. It's a very surface level conversation from buzzing somebody's ear. 
And on that note, <laughs> we have lots of land for sale. Some of the cheapest electricity. <laughs> if you want to do a satellite campus, I heard, is it Columbia Garth Community College or yes. where it was looking at a brew science, maybe building a brew science. Um, and I said, keep us in mind, keep us in mind, but I think the river is advocating to put somewhere on their property. So we, if you are looking, we have Native American fishery, a lot of Native American fish um, connection here, as well as, um, uh, what else was I thinking? Historical and so archeological uh, and fish sciences. So any of those, if you're thinking, we need to add some of these things. We have, <laughs> we have fisheries, mm -hmm. we have fisheries science program. Right, yeah. and I know yeah. we do right out here, and um, you do some. So it'd be great to have that somehow advertised. Mm -hmm. I don't, um, even if it's just a seasonal flyer you sent to yes. our community. I think it's very interesting. I mean, before the pandemic, we kept hearing a higher and higher demand for online classes, and we got to figure that out because we had to quickly. And now we're hearing that people want in person again. They want they want to gather together to learn. Somehow there would be a combination, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And coming to maybe having a booth at an event sometime, we do one yeah. September community picnic. Mm -hmm. um, that might be a great opportunity. We have a community picnic once a year, and the whole community is invited to end. Um, other um, agencies have come as well to be represented. And we can notify you when that date is and mm -hmm. give you lots of advance notice. Mm -hmm. But it's a great way to reach uh, quite a bit of the park. Last year we had about 200 people in town. So it's a good opportunity. The National Guard comes out, the sheriff, the health clinic, and so that might be something for you to do. And get, you to get dinner and music too. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we'll have it. Maybe we'll have a little crappy. So uh, any other comments or questions or? Yeah, what, what district is passing on to? Zone one? So the way I want to say, you know? Okay. Yeah. Is that one? No, I Yes. And she is, uh, has said that she she's in her seventh year. She has said she will not be running again. So, you know, that's the only thing I want to hear again. So, <laughs> We need somebody from zone one. Um, okay. And if there's any other questions, um, being put in contact, yes. um, you can let George know when you get a permission. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, yes. Yes. Thank you for bringing that. Yeah. Thank you for coming out here. And <laughs> we might have a couple of we'll be on our way back. It's all good. Thank you very much. For Thank you. Too. I appreciate it. Uh, parents of interested citizens. We have one. Uh, this is Tiffany Pruitt. Just a real sh short one. Uh, I don't even know if I need to sit down, but uh, something was added to the council packet tonight that you guys got that's not uh, in the online packet. It would just be nice if those things would be added on later online so that the rest of the citizens, citizens can see what it is. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Uh, public hearing. No public hearing. Okay. Action item. Approved resolution 1496 strategic plan. Okay. Um, so in late winter, early spring 23, to Temple Hundred New Warren Institute. Uh, for policy research and engagement, we create the city's strategic plan. The first step was the creation of the Community Vision Steering Committee. The committee held meetings on the board dates March 28th, April 11th, July 26th, and September 6th, 2023. The committee started by creating a survey for input. Card and digital copies of the survey were available for input from a public for the month of April and during the community to make The committee also developed a draft mission, vision, and values. The public open house associated at City Hall on May 6th to review the draft mission, vision, and values. You will staff compile the results of the survey and the open house and create a first draft 
of the plan, including action items. The committee reviewed the plan and action items and provided additional feedback. The draft was sent out for public review in late September. Council did an initial review of the council uh, at the council meeting on October 23rd, 23. At the meeting, council requested a dedicated work session to review that draft. Council met on December 13th, 2023 to review the plan, notes and changes subscribed by Administrator Bennett, and worked with U of O staff to update the restricted plan. Presented today is the final draft after feedback from city staff, committee members, general public, and council. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the draft? Yes. I motion to approve resolution 1496 and adopt the city of Cascade Block strategic plan. Is there a second? I second. Discussion? I, I just want to say I appreciate that we've gone over this several times and that we've made um, many adjustments that I looked through and felt that I saw. Were good. Hang on, Council Miller, Miller Hutter, and first. Um, I was just going to say I, I noticed that a lot of the things I had commented on um, were changed, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, it looks a lot better. Um, however, one of them, um, in reference to it reads return authority of setting fees and rates to city council, um, I won't be able to support that. So that's all. Councilmember Miller? Yeah, there's a few things in here. Uh, I second uh, Councilmember Farrell's uh, feelings on uh, the fees and taxes. I couldn't support it with that either. There's also the rare program in it which is under DR 1.4. The rare program pretty much commits the city to hiring an intern from the University of Oregon at a rate of $26,000 for about eight, nine months, plus supplying that person with a workstation and computer. And I do not believe that uh, we can afford expenditures like that. And so, and also, I still did not like the lack of citizen participation in the steering committee. And I didn't like in that, uh, oh, some wording in here, the limit, uh, the page one, Uh, limited staff capacity corresponding on equal application of the city's development and nuisance code to make it very unfriendly. Um, in the business environment, uh, this is kind of the wording in here sounds like you're throwing the staff under the bus. I would recommend that that be changed to limited staff capacity has created challenges in the application uh, saying that they are un unequal in the application that I will be wrong. So and what page was this? Page 20 would be the third paragraph. Is that isn't that in community findings? So that's that's comments from the community. Yeah, well but it's still in keep it plan here. We have some information. I'm done, so. Um, Councilman Baker. Uh, Council, part of the information, Councilman Miller, where are you talking about the the rare intern? Is that under a goal? Uh, because I. Where is DR 1.4? Right, so it's just a recommendation. It's not committing us. And I think it's a fine recommendation. I brought up the idea of a rare intern last year. 
um, because even at that cost, it's significantly less than hiring a planner or whatever we chose for them to do. And um, it is my understanding that a rare intern in the past here are rare interns that did, I have only received glowing report from the rare interns that were here before. Um, and again, it's just a goal. It's not telling us we have to do it. So I, I don't find issue with that. Any other comments or questions? Okay, it's been moved to approve. It's been seconded. We have a roll call vote. Council Member Prompton. Aye. Emily Baker. Aye. Farrell. No. Wait this year, sorry. Oh. I'm I'm not here. Here. I can't come to see you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Council Member Happy. We can't hear you. He's muted. You're muted, Pete. He said, I. Thank you. Keller? Aye. Miller? No. Mayor Bell? Aye. Strategic plan passes. And on to the emergency communication procedures, Chief. Nope. Dave, sorry. <laughs> Approve lobbyist quote. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll do a read the synopsis, synopsis for you real quick. At the December 11th, 23 council meeting, Administrator Brennan presented quotes for lobbying services. A motion for Leo Capital Consulting did not receive a second, and the motion died. A motion for Building Innovations LLC was made and received a second. The motion failed due to lack of votes. The motion for Leo Capital Consulting was made again and received a second. Council then debated if the motion that died due to the lack of the second could be brought again. The motion was drawn and council consensus to have Administrator Bennett ask City Attorney Cleveland if the motion that died could be brought back in the same year. City Attorney Cleveland stated there is no issue with the motion being brought back up after the previously died due to the lack of a second. Attached to review are all the courts originally obtained by City Administrator Bennett for lobbying services during the 24 legislative session to secure funding for the McCord Creek electrical line relocation. Below is a list of the firm's contact and the list was, list of the firms was provided by Jim McCauley, legislative director for League of Oregon Cities. I guess any questions about how we got to this point? Yeah, no. Um, in the packet, also, you will see an additional quote. Um, I think it's separate on your desk from CFN advisors, I think is their name, advocates. Um, Councillor Happy, and um, please correct me if I'm speaking um, incorrectly, reached out to CFM um, asking about why their uh, proposal was so much higher than everybody else's in a discussion um, about long term. I believe I added the email as well from CFM advocates. Um, I also had a talk with Dan Marr from Marr uh, Strategies, Marr Consulting, I don't remember his title or his company name, Strategies, um, about this lobbying effort. Um, he did not provide or did not want to provide a quote for this go around, um, but did suggest that having one, even if it was for short term, gets us a foot in the door to build those relationships. Um, and he is open to doing a long-term contract with the city and the port. So. And he's currently contracted with the port. He's currently contracted with the port, yes. Is Council unhappy? Did, is he still there? Wait. Okay. I'm here. Council member unhappy, would you like to, I know you're traveling and you're in an airport, so I don't know if you are have limited time, but... Would you like to call? Well, I can, if, sure, if this is the appropriate time to do that, I'm happy to share. Uh, I guess my conversations that I had with CFM was, was specifically with Wayland. Uh, and so Wayland is the lobbyist who's really his experience is, is uh, working with ODOT on transportation issues. So he's the one that put together this proposal. And I, I reached out to them because I want the question I had for him was because in the original proposal, they suggested that it would be better to wait till the 2025 um, budget season, you know, to you know, to try to lobby for 
that one million dollar appropriation. And what came up with council at our last council meeting was the concern that if we already had secured a loan, would that make it less likely for us to be able to get funds? And so that was the question I put to them. If they're making that recommendation that they see that as an issue. And the second question I had was why was there so high? Um, and what he explained to me was that when they wrote the bid for the three month contract uh, for the short session, that that was with the idea that it was going to require a lot of political capital to get it approved. A lot of, I, I think it would be very aggressive. He said they'd have to, you know, use up a lot of political capital to get that approved. And he thought it was probably still unlikely. Um, so his recommendation was that, uh, you know, waiting until 2025 made more sense. And he was recommending that begin with uh, kind of middle of 2024 with interagency lobbying, which is something you can see in the printed one we got from them on Friday. Uh, that's a little bit different from everybody else. So prior to then going to the state and politicians seeking funding from the state, he would first just go straight to ODOT to see if we could get some uh, funding from them. Um, you know, why are they treating us differently than maybe other cities where they've had similar projects where they have uh, paid for those utilities to be relocated? Uh, and I guess the through my conversation with them, one of the other things that came up was that lobbyists, really, their goal is to generate enough revenue to come in to more than cover the cost of their services. Uh, so it's a, an investment that we're making. Uh, we've got a lot of projects that we really need some help with. You know, we have an attorney that's on retainer. Um, I guess what, I, I could wait on this until after we maybe have a, a motion and we could get to some discussion, but that was just kind of explaining maybe that second proposal. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Okay. Um, the, I move to hire for the, let me look at the proposed motion. Um, uh, I, I motion to approve the quote from Tess Melio in the amount of, I think it was $2,500 a month. Look, 3000 per month to provide lobbying services during the 2024 Oregon legislative session. Okay, so second. I'll second. Okay, discussion. I, um, looking at the bids that range from 3,000 to I believe 15,000 a month, Tess came in at the lower level, I have asked more folks from Salem uh, recommendation positively or negatively, and I have heard um, somebody that didn't know that test and somebody who said highly recommended. Um, and uh, Tess has worked for CFM in the past and wanted to go out on her own. Um, uh, and previously said that she has um, worked on projects with ODOT, I believe, Oregon Energy. Um, I feel, as was mentioned by Council Happy, that we need some support in this legislative session. I've heard that from folks when I've been asking for recommendations. Even if CFM is correct that it might not, we might get even more if we wait or continue to lobby. I am of the mind, yes, it would be great if we could retain somebody for $5,000 a month with state and federal affiliations for 12 months a year, but I don't think we have that money right now to do 5,000 times 12. Um, I would love to possibly have the same lobbyist as the port, but we don't have any numbers from him. Is that right? I have rough numbers. Oh yeah, but it, and it ranges. Uh, let's see, where is it? Anywhere from four to seven thousand a month, depending on what we're scope of work, whether it's just state or state and federal or 
what kind of project it is, or if it's a joint agreement. So it's a pretty big range. And he would like it long term. Yes. So 12 months a year. Yeah. And the reason then I am currently voting for TESS is we did not budget for this in our current budget. Um, and yet, I think it is, we would be financially irresponsible to spend a hundred thousand dollars on something we didn't expect without doing our due diligence and getting a lobbyist. So we would be out 7,500, which I think we can budget for. I understand possibly um, 10,000 if, I don't think we go back to December because we don't have it. Or three times, I'm sorry, yeah, about 10,000, three times uh, three to see if this lobbyist can, as council member Happy mentioned, bring in more money than it cost us. And that would give us a good experience. I don't know, I haven't with this council worked with the lobbyist to see how is, is it really helping? And then we might reconsider different bids for in our new budget year for a long-term, um, particularly if we then are freed up of some funds that aren't being spent on ODOT. Personally, I think we need a lobbyist this term. Test comes with good recommendation. I believe from what I'm hearing will work well with this legislative body and is in session every day in Salem. So we're, she's not gonna miss anything. Um, and it would be a good example. There's an ending to this. It's not a 12 month contract. That's why I would choose Tess. And I see uh, Tess Melios on online Tess. Would you like to speak? Hello, can you see me? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, hi everyone, um, mayor, members of the council. Good evening, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I saw, I had friends in the room earlier, uh, Jeff Reardon and Annette Matson, but I guess they have left. Um, <laughs> um, well, yeah, so my name is Tess Milio and I'm the owner and lobbyist at Milio Capital Consulting. And you've seen my proposal. I'm so grateful for you guys all considering my bid um, to help Cascade Locks advocate in the halls of Salem. And I, you know, I just wanted to put, a, I'm here to put a face to the name and um, that's all I really wanted to do tonight. So good to see you. So I have a question for you. Can you talk a little in your proposal you, um, that you would consider an off ramp should it become clear early that the project would not get funded? Yeah, um, that was partially because of a conversation I had had um, with your city administrator. Um, prior to putting in the proposal just about how, you know, there have been concerns that, you know, you don't want to pay for something when you already know that you're absolutely not going to get your ask, right? Um, so the idea there is uh, bringing this ask forward to the legislature, starting to have some feeler conversations with some key folks who are going to make the decision and see how it goes. Um, probably that would take at least a month um, to, you know, get those meetings set up get all the materials ready and, and talk to those folks and then hear back. Um, and then, you know, if it really was not a feasible project for this session, um, at that point, we could probably just end our contract early. So that's what I'm offering. Okay. Any questions for Tess? Tess, can you talk about um, any experience you have with ODOT or similar funding, similar challenges that we're, what we're facing? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I have worked with ODOT uh, for many years. Um, I'm close with their lobbyists down in Salem. Uh, and I, you know, have worked for several cities asking for funding. So I, at one point, represented a coalition of different cities who were trying to get a small amount of money for Highway 99 West. Um, we were unsuccessful in that session because that does happen, right? Um, and it was a tough budget year. Um, but then just last year, I helped um, secure um, basically a, a lot more EV uh, funding 
it was millions of dollars from ODOT directly just by getting legislators to weigh in with them. So it was not a legislative decision, but it was actually the Oregon Transportation Commission that I was able to get um, millions of dollars more than they had planned on giving uh, towards EV um, infrastructure. So really the chargers. Um, so that was something that I just recently did. Um, and that's just two projects. I mean, I actually, I've worked with ODOT on a lot more things. I'm remembering there was a right away issue with the city of Eugene, um, you know, things like that. So Yes, have a lot of experience. Thank you. Council Member Crompton. Hello, Gus. Um, I was curious on if you've ever had any success in the short session um, gaining the funding you're looking for, or has it been mostly from the normal session? Yes, um, it is easier to get money in the uh, traditional long session. Um, that's because it is the two year budget cycle. And that's where they, you know, are really looking at everything that they have. Whereas the short session is supposed to be more for fixes and emergencies. Um, however, I, I, you know, I believe that we can talk about your issue coming up um, late, too late for the for the two year budget cycle. And there's a reason for bringing it now. I have worked on this. I have gotten stuff in budgets um, in the short session, but I've also um, seen the short session not happen, right? In a, I think it was in 2020, it all shut down um, when Republicans and, and Democrats couldn't agree and um, there were walkouts. So and no bills passed that session. So even though, you know, things were lined up in the budget, may not happen. Um, so just, yes, I have had success. I also think, um, you know, it's it's very un, unclear what will happen without conversations. Thank you. Tess, can you talk a little bit about your, um, how you're going to, your communication, how you communicate, how it's going? You mean with legislators? Yeah, updates, just, if you were to be hired, how is your communication? Updates so, with you. Oh, sorry. Updates with you all or updates with the legislators? Just questioning. Uh, updates um, with Jordan, uh, oh. our city administrator, just to kind of, how often are we going to hear from you? <laughs> sure. Um, well, because this is a short session and a really timely issue, you're going to, he's going to be hearing from me all the time. Um, probably multiple times a week, we'll be in communication so he knows what's going on. Um but at least once a week. And then I really plan on, you know, my firm is just me. So I'm able to make um, decisions that work for the client. And so really it would be about us figuring out what the best method of communication is uh, for him and for you all. Uh, and just kind of then implementing that as we go forward. So, you know, I expect either phone calls, emails, um, but we would be in touch very often because this is a you know, as you've heard from other firms, this would take a lot of work uh, to get something passed in such a short amount of time. Council Member, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, were you invited to speak at this session by anybody on the, on the council? No, I uh, I did submit a form, but I submitted it, I think, late after the deadline, so. No. Okay. That's all I have for that. Any other questions? Yeah. Council Member Happy? Yes. Hi there, Tess. Uh, you and I spoke on the phone a few weeks ago. It was before Christmas. It feels like ages ago. Um, it's good to see you this evening. Thank you for being here. And I just want to make sure I understand because I, I thought that what I understood when we talked on the phone. Um, that 2025 was definitely the better time to ask. And that's why we had the off ramp in there. Um, that is still correct. We're just trying to test the waters a little bit with 2024, correct? Yes. Um, and I guess my question is, could you see a situation where that could be detrimental and may in fact actually um, not just be, uh, you know, it could actually make it more difficult for us to get funding in 2025, you know, if we're browbeating, uh, you know, and, and being aggressive in the off season? 
You know, I don't see that as a downside. Um, in fact, I think that waiting could potentially be detrimental in that it didn't seem urgent enough for you all to go forward and ask them um, for this money when this issue came up. So, um, you know, I think that if this is not the time and you're not successful, this is laying the groundwork then for the longer session. So I, I think it's worth it, especially just trying to feel out those initial conversations with those key folks. Thank you. And I had a few other comments, if I may. Um, yes. my, I originally was thinking that this is just the wrong time uh, you know, the, to make this ask, and we don't have it in the budget. Um, what you just said puts that, I guess, a little bit of ease for me to feel like we're not going to be shooting ourselves in the foot, uh, and we could just be laying some groundwork for the future. I do believe we've got a lot of issues in the city that would benefit from having uh, a lobbyist represent the city's interest in Salem and potentially in Washington, D.C. I know that's something that you don't necessarily offer, but I think that we've got our train quiet zone. Um, that's a federal issue that we're going to need some support from you know, to, to get that through. Um, the city of Cascade Locks is small compared to uh, you know, the railroad, so it's difficult for us to get traction there. We've got Forest Lane. We have no bike lane there. There's no sidewalks. It's poorly lit. Uh, I think it's dangerous for pedestrians. We've got this, you know, pedestrian bridge from downtown. It's this pine that sky dream to get down to the Marine Park. You know, we've got a lot, a lot going on in our city that would really benefit from having a lobbyist uh, helping us get funding to make those projects become a reality. We also have a strategic plan with all these ideas and dreams. Um, we have an attorney that's on retainer. I think it is makes sense for us to actually have a longer term relationship with a lobbyist. And I think that it's something we should be looking at when we're writing the next year's budget to see where we can get those funds to actually make that happen. Um, but I guess I, I, I feel like we wouldn't necessarily be, uh, I think it makes sense to do uh, a test run in the off season and uh, see whether or not this is something that's going to, um, if it's, we're not getting a warm reception, um, then like Tess said, we're, we're at least laying the groundwork and then we can table it and maybe bring this back uh, when it's a better time. And also after we've uh, maybe considered a, a more longer term relationship with a lobbying, you know, a lobbying firm. Jordan, can you reiterate how this is going to be paid or where the funds are coming from since it wasn't budgeted? Yes, so this would come from contract services out of the electric department, uh, 300 total, 300,000 total um, across the city proper in South Lake. But, um, that is generally meant for um, any emergency repairs during winter. Um, we used about 130 grand last budget year. I don't know, know the number off the top of my head, but we've used less than 60 so far this year. Um, and the most of that has been vegetation management. We have used Dennis Snyder and as well as paying for the rate study. Um, we also have 30,000 committed from that line going towards McKed to help us with um, administering the EDA rate. Um, I would like to echo um, some of the thoughts that Mr. Happy had. Uh, this is roughly 1% of the budget for this project. And for us to spend 1% for the opportunity to provide extra funding and the relationships, I, I feel it's a necessary cost. Any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing if there are or not, there has been a motion and a second motion. So now we, we've had discussion, we move to vote. Roll call vote. Council Member Crompton. Aye. Emmerling Baker. Aye. Farrell. Aye. Happy. Aye. Keller. Aye. Miller. No. Mayor Fallon. Aye. Get it passed. Aye. Tess, I will get in contact with you tomorrow morning. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tess. Okay, now we're on to committee appointments. 
plus u. Okay, um, so I thought it would just to kind of break down um, where we stand with our committees at the moment. Um, we have four committees, the newly created charter review, tourism, budget, and architectural review. Um, of the seven seats for charter review, all seven are still open. Tourism of the seven seats, three of them are open, two of them from resignations last year, and one of them from a term that just expired. Um, on December 31st. The budget committee is 14 seats. Half of them are council. The other seven are um, committed. Committed members, four of those expired at the end of this last calendar year. That's where those four came. Architectural review has three seats. It's had one vacancy on it since I've been here. Uh, they only meet once in a blue moon when it's required when a new structure is going up into the untax to ensure it meets architectural standards. Uh, we received three applications for the Charter Review Committee and one for the Budget Committee. Uh, Marianne Bump, Courtney Kielman, and Elizabeth Laurel Nogood uh, for the Charter Review and Tiffany Pruitt for the Budget Committee. You uh, did run this past um, City Recorder Woosley. They can be appointed one by one or all in one motion. Let's do one by one. We'll just, how about if we go in, in order of stack that we have? Can I ask a question? Sure. So what if we don't get um, seven for the charter review? We just have to get at least four to have a point. Mm -hmm. Not ideal, but we have to have at least four for a point. Councilor Miller? I understand there's been two applications submitted after their deadline. Uh, for the charter review? Yeah. Uh, we actually got three or four between Friday and today. They weren't what time kind of for them in the packet. So we'll review the next council meeting. Okay. So I guess that brings up the other option the council wants to wait until they have a chance to review all the applications. I would rather review all the applications. And so are we going to keep it open then if somebody else wants to? Until, until all seven are filled, yes, it the same. I'd rather yeah. wait then too until we have them all. Okay. okay. And that's Keller just for the review or for the council member Baker. Baker. Hold on. Uh, council member Keller. So, I will get first is Kyleman. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, I would like to respect the people that were respectful of the deadline, responsible, and got their applications in early. And we can review the rest um, to fill the remaining vacancies. I'm open to that. Sorry for that. I'm I'm open as a bacon. I'm open as well. And it's noggity. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm very minimum. I'd like to go up with budget giving the applications tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone you can make a motion at any point. Just go ahead. So if you want to move the discussion along. All right. So it gets down to um, voting on these this evening, the ones that met the deadline, they're here now, and then we can still, next council meeting, look at the remainder in the packet and then to fill those vacancies. Is that consensus or? I'm open actually to either way that this body generally wants. Okay, so kind of mixed. Which way would you like to go? Well, let's honor the ones that have already submitted their applications and get it out now. Agreed. Everybody in agreement? I just want to point out that Elizabeth Laurel Nogati is my sister, but I don't think that there is a financial, ethical, any conflicts. Conflict there. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to move forward. Okay. All right. Let's. Um, in my packet, I have. How do you pronounce the words? Los India. Same word. No, I'm not going to. I'm All right. So Elizabeth Laurel Monkey. She is up for charter review committee. 
a motion to accept. Thank you. I want them to appoint Miss Nagadi. No, sorry, I Nagadi. Oh my gosh, to the charter review committee. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Council member on the bottom. Uh, Council member Denise described this as her sister. She also works for the court. And there could be a potential conflict there. Uh, I don't like this idea, especially a charter review committee and having a relative on that. That's just way too close, and we're getting into a lot of nepotism here. Uh, so I would not be in favor of this. Councilmember Kelly? I would like to note that Mr. Blue served on this council and also was financially employed by the court. <clears throat> Good point. Councilmember Baker? And we do have somebody on a planning committee related to somebody on council. And I want to remind this board, this council, that a committee <clears throat> serves to investigate and recommend. We still have all the power to vote on anything. We're asking them to do some of the work to investigate and recommend, not to make any decisions. So if the fact that somebody is related to me, again, this, this town is very small. I'm sure there have been examples in the past of relatives on a committee and on council and or court staff and or um, so that if you look at Laurel's background, it's a giant amount of uh, great experience and intellectual knowledge that she would bring to uh, any kind of literature review, which the charter review is um, and research. Council on the Uh Answering uh, Council Member Keller, uh, when Jeremiah was a city councilor, he recused himself from all dealings that involved the court. Councilor Keller. What would the charter have to deal with any forms with the court? This seems redundant and wasteful of our time. Like, Okay, so in interest, there's been a motion, it's been seconded, we've had discussion. Is there any other discussion? All right, roll call vote. Council Member Crompton. Aye. Emily Baker. Aye. Farrell. Aye. Happy. Aye. Keller. Aye. Miller. No. Mayor Fell. Aye. So, Laurel, not happy. Passes. So she uh, will be on charter review committee. Okay, next one up uh, is Courtney Kielman. Kielman. All right, Courtney Kielman. Is there a motion? I motion to appoint Courtney Kielman to the charter review committee. All right, sorry. Okay, discussion? Okay, hearing there's no discussion, let's go to roll call vote. Council Member Crompton. Aye. Emily Baker. Aye. Farrell. Aye. Happy. Aye. Keller. Aye. Miller. Aye. Mayor Fountain. Aye. Courtney Kyleman. Aye. Appointed charter reading committee. Thank you. Congratulations. All right. Next one is uh, Marianne Bump. She is for the charter review. I motion to appoint Mary Ann Bob to the Charter Review Committee. I second. Discussion? <laughs> Discussion. I, I'm noting that Mary Ann did not put her name under budget, but instead Charter Review. And I thought Mary Ann did appoint her name on budget, but I don't see Mary Ann to see if that's 
some things she would address it. Her she still has two years on it. She's still on the Oh, you're going to be on two committees? Yeah. yeah. Bernard's on all of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can ask her. Or close to. Okay. Now that. Close to elected this year. Yes, exactly. Okay. Any other discussion? Right. Hearing that there's no other discussion, the roll call vote. Councilmember Crompton. Aye. Emily Baker. Aye. Farrell. Aye. Happy. Pete, you read the leg and didn't catch your sign. Aye. Keller. Aye. Miller. Aye. Mayor Fell. Aye. All right, she Marianne don't pass it and she will be on the charter review. Okay, next one up. This is Tiffany Pruitt. She is for applying for the budget committee. A motion to appoint Tiffany Pruitt to the budget committee. Discussion? Hey, Marianne. It was eye opening last year, and thank you for your detailed um, comments and work. Okay. Motion second, hearing there is any other discussion. Would you like a roll call vote? Council Member Prompted? Aye. Emily Baker? Aye. Farrell? Aye. Happy? Aye. Keller? Aye. Miller? Aye. Mayor Bell? Aye. Happy. Well, Stephanie Pruitt, welcome to the budget. Again. 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 You're good at it. Okay, so now we're on the reports and presentations. Committee report. I know the committee reports. And we will know that the floor is going to be in the library right now. I'll that later. So they should report this next meeting. Um, the contract did state um, that they did quarterly reports. I don't know okay. when the next quarter reports. I can ask. Okay. All right, then not to move them on. So now we're on to emergency communication procedures. Never. I, I did ask people to enroll us into this quarterly report for the councils. It's covering multiple talks. The emergency communication procedures was the initial discussion. It was. Uh, so in my staff report, uh, it just starts out with a uh, year in review of 2023. Uh, we ran 425 calls. Uh, there was also a spreadsheet uh, that I originally submitted to, to Jordan, and then today I got even more into the the weeds and nerded out just a little bit on our uh, responses. Um, we came up with 77 percent of our calls last year were medical, 23 uh, percent. Or fire. We did take one inner facility transfer from Hood River to a Portland area hospital. Uh, and then I have them broke down uh, into months and number of calls per month. Uh, by far, July was our busiest month uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And then I broke it into areas that we respond. Cascade Locks includes the city as well as our area on I-84 that's within Hood River County, within our annual service area. So don't think that 297 calls happen just in the city. It's in that stretch of freeway and the city. Uh, Samania County is uh, obviously all the Samania County that we respond to. Hood River County is from mile post 56. Yes. Uh, and that's moving up the fires of our ambulance. Or covering mutual aid medical calls if somebody's unavailable, if whatever is unavailable. Uh, then Multnomah County is our contracted area within Multnomah County, which is uh, Multnomah Falls to the county line. Uh, and then Wasco County is responding to mutual aid calls out there. The three in April are actually move ups, uh, with one move up with an ambulance to help uh, help them out when they were really low in the river and Parkdale could not staff an ambulance to go. And we had one staff as well as a backup staff here in the city. Uh, and while we were there, we picked up two medical calls. Uh, so, and then the other three in Wasco County were wildland fires. Uh, so it's really broke down into to medical and fire. 
But within medical, you have trail rescues, you have motor vehicle collisions, heart attacks, so all the medical and trauma stuff are in there. In fire, uh, you have wildland fire, structure fires, lift assist, fire alarm activations, uh, anything that's not medical is all in there. Uh, so it was really interesting for me to dive into this data and, and figure out where we're spending most of our time and what we're spending it on. Uh, and then I really got into our uh, ambulance transports this year. Uh, we had 153 transports in the uh, year 2023. We went to 11 different hospitals. And then kind of some historical data. In 2021, we had 127 uh, transports. Uh, and then 2022 was a weird anomaly. We had 172 transports. Um, that was right after COVID. And our call volume went up in 2022, uh, just with everybody back on the road, back, on the road, back doing things. Um, we really spiked in 2022. So it'll be interesting to see how 2024 uh, shakes out and uh, what the numbers are. Uh, any questions about what we responded to, where it was, any of that uh, data? Uh, I have a question. Now, the cascade locks calls are obviously calls originating here. Do you have a breakdown of the calls in Cascade Locks that are for non-residents? I have actually asked our uh, billing provider to give me that information if they can, uh, based on the number of transports, who is actually using the service the most. Um, but like a total granular one that if we were getting transport, then I probably don't have that data because we don't track that, but on the transports, we definitely track that whether the resident and non-resident and that affects their, their bill. So I'm waiting for the billing company to get back to me. Uh, I tried to decipher some of their reports and was unsuccessful, so I reached out today because uh, I knew that question was coming up. And as soon as I get that answer, I will forward it to Jordan uh, for you. Uh, if this continues, like with July being the highest um, this this year that we're in, do I mean, how did you handle that? Do we need to do make any changes to be better prepared for that high number of calls, or did we do okay? I think we did okay, and that kind of leads into the next uh, bullet point is our seasonal staffing grant from the state fire marshal's office. Uh, that drastically helped our situation, adding uh, those two full-time seasonal positions and putting that puts an extra person at the station for ten hours a day, seven days a week. And on Tuesdays, there's there's two extra people there, so there's four people on duty on Tuesdays, and Tuesdays was the day we picked because it's also our drill night to allow them to attend our drills and uh, really get in to uh, meet all the volunteers and interact with them. Um, but I'm hoping that the state fire marshal continues that grant program and we are going to apply for it again next year, this year, if they do. Um, this year they really focused on the, the hydrant system and going out and making sure all of the hydrants were in inventory, that they were all greased, that they got we needed at least once. Uh, and then they took notes of what that hydrant needs going forward, whether it needs painting or snow flag. Uh, and so we're going to start working on budgeting and paint and that sort of stuff for them to do this year. Um, so we can keep our hydrants looking good and accessible. The snow is coming, so are you, they all had flags. Some of the flags were, you know, <laughs> a little wonky, but you know, as money uh, comes available, we can replace those with uh, flags that aren't as old and beat up. Also, what was so different about October? October was the second highest month of the year. That is a great question. I think it. You know, it was a very mild October. There wasn't much weather-wise to really drive down our numbers. Um, 
And so people were were out doing things still. Um, September's always been kind of a little weird anomaly. Uh, sometimes it's really high, sometimes it's really low. Um, but the October was a little, little weird. Uh, I didn't exactly go back through like the reports and kind of figure out what type of calls happened in October. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a little funky. Thank you for chasing down that grant again, if it's available. And um, uh, the last uh, paragraph, uh, talking about pushing out information. Um, it's a very tricky and hard thing to do. Uh, myself, uh, one of our firefighter paramedics, and another uh, person are the three people that have access to utilize Cascade Lost Fire and EMS uh, Facebook page. Um, and if we're all on the incident and busy, um, we don't exactly have a lot of time to push out that information. Uh, how I look at information, if it's going to impact the community and there's going to be evacuation notices, that kind of stuff, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to post. I'm going to try to get that word out as soon as possible. If the incident is blocking a major escape route from the town, I'm going to push that information out as soon as possible. If it's an incident that is fairly visible, but is not going to impact the community in any way, or is not blocking any sort of major escape route, I'm going to get to it when I can get to it. Uh, it's not that we're trying to hold the hold information. Um, and depending on where it's at, I may be on one or two or three different radios trying to coordinate a response. Uh, I have looked into um, apps that do it. Uh, the most prevalent one in the Northwest is Pulse Point, um, which sends out an alert to people who have the app, who follow said agency, that they're responding to a call. It doesn't necessarily give any updates like, oh, evacuation notices. It's just, there's a call in this area, so people are aware. And, and for a year, for our size, it's $18,000, which is way too, too expensive. Um, so I'm always open to new ideas and how we can push out information uh, faster, quicker, uh, accurate is the big thing. Um, so just know that I work very hard to make posts on incidents that greatly impact our community. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you've touched base of best practices, but I know we live in a very small community. A lot of people have your phone number, yeah. and there was a fire incident where there were um, citizens in the community that were texting him, and he is on a big fire. He's not going to post on Facebook. That's not what he's thinking. So if, because a lot of, and we all know everybody, people have our phone numbers, so maybe I know people were texting me, and I said, keep an eye on your web, or on your Facebook page. You'll, you'll make a post as soon as, as mm -hmm. soon as you know. So try to mitigate and lessen calls to you. So is there any other best practices that you would like to see? No, I mean- Just refer to your Facebook page? Refer to your Facebook page. It's really our best avenue right now. Uh, is our Facebook page. Uh, I know zero about Twitter uh, or Instagram. I do have a personal Instagram, but I really don't know how to use it. Um, so Facebook is kind of our platform right now to post out information. And we try very hard to post as soon as we can. Um, just know that if it's like a fire and they're, it's a real fire, uh, as the incident commander, I'm talking on our dispatch channel with our dispatch center, on a TAC channel with my staff and volunteers uh, and other responding agencies talking to me on both channels. Uh, so it's very confusing uh, to say the least, just in our county. And if we're in Multnomah County, I'm talking to Portland Dispatch, whatever Dispatch, my staff, and they're all on different radio frequencies. Uh, so I have a lot going on in a short little time. Uh, and I always try to post as, as much as possible, um, but it is a challenge. 
we're not fortunate enough to have a PIO that's dedicated to do that. And even if we could afford one, they're still not going to be at every incident because they um, we can't predict our emergencies. Councilmember Baker, thank you. I was wondering is if you're comfortable or if you thought it would be good for the city to put on their web page or you just that quick reassurance. If there's an emergency and it impacts the community, we'll let you know. Otherwise, do not text or call. Please just look at our web page. Something like that. Yeah, I can uh, make a Facebook post about that. Um, Post it on our city website. And then the best practice of the city can yeah. repost it on there. Snow coming and people taking things in emergency, too. Maybe that's a good time. And you know, I mean, I've been because my husband's a volunteer fireman and has been at other places. I've seen a volunteer PIO, but it takes a long time to get someone you trust. I know that. Yes. And that's willing to show up. It was interesting to watch the Facebook post on the last fire and the whole said it was going to was spreading to the forest and everything. And I knew it wasn't, but I just kept saying, wait, wait for the post. There's updates. It's going to be okay. And, you know, I just said, keep, I kept referring them back to your Facebook. And then your Facebook, you guys share that on all the other platforms too? So I tried to, yes. Okay. Uh, I try to share it to all the Cascade Box community pages, okay. but if it's if we're on an active incident and it's uh, hey this is gonna happen, mm -hmm. like it's just gonna be on our our Facebook page. I'm not gonna have the time to share it to the umpteen okay. different Cascade Box so, fire right or Cascade right. Box pages. Right, they seem to be multiplying relatively quickly. Um, yeah. So. Okay. I try to post to all those other Cascade Box pages, um, especially if it's like an announcement like, hey, we're having an open house. But if it's like, hey, an emergency is happening, like, yeah. I'm just going to post to mine and hope that somebody shares it to those other ones. Okay. Because um, I have a lot going on. Right. Absolutely. I presume if it's an emergency that impacts the community, is there a chain that it Information goes to our city administrator or our mayor, or I call the city. I call the city administrator. Okay, yeah. so he can maybe yeah. disseminate yeah. some information. Yeah. John's job is respond to incident. My job is to make sure the word gets out. If it's an incident in coordination with county emergency services, at some point they would take over, or the state, depending on the size of the incident. Do you ever share to the social media platforms to? So that he's busy, he calls you. You do the thing, or is that? I have access to, but I, have, I know how. Kathy mostly do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and usually the social media platforms pick up yours, and they automatically share it. Yeah. 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 It seems like as soon as I share something on Facebook, KTU, KGW, they're all emailing me very quickly. You're getting bombarded. Yeah. And turn in and send. Um, I did have a question for you on um, some of the fire hydrants for the new construction. Mm -hmm. They have the meters left on them, mm -hmm. and one of them it's right on Windsong. Yep. On that, and it's they can't get their car in and out because of the meter that's sticking out like this far. So I said I would bring it up to you and see if you could take we a look at it over this summer, and. When the hose was there, they were having issues doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I took up some of our old hose ramps uh, so they could drive over the hose. Um, but I wasn't aware that the meter was an issue. Uh, the meters and that stuff is more of a public works thing mm -hmm. um, than a fire department thing. Okay. Uh, if they we get a call and need to access that hydrant, we'll just spin that meter off. Um, and set it to the side. So, is that something the city we just keep the meters on? And no, I don't think they're there for the duration of the project because yeah. they need water. Yeah, and then we read that meter and we charge them for the water they use. Oh, okay. Yes. It sounds like they only used it during the summer to keep the dust yeah, down. Yeah. Not using it now. Right. So, and I'll get it with you and see if it, if it needs to stay on till summer again. 
It's not that big. It's pretty big. You go on in the third Well, it's tall. It's tall, so you got a map. You have to go take a look. A lot of third one. And back to the responses, we did have one call this year in our city that Scamania came and transported for us because we were on another incident. Uh, so, which is just one, just one. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. Really good job. You know, questions? I mean, we went through that more than they can do. So, mm -hmm. that's a plus. Yep. Thank you again for all you do as a staff. Feeling happy with the, I thought there was some change of hours or? Yes, I like the 48 hour shift. I can't remember the incident, but there we got hoses destroyed in some fire and you needed to get them replaced when you were going to look to see if there was a crash or anything. Did we all get that all figured out? Uh, the the wildland hoses that got destroyed on fire were replaced by Hogan Apartment Forestry. So, nice. It was their fire. Army Creek. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any others? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all you do. And thank you for your report. Thank you for standing up. Yeah. So. That's good information. Pencil procedures review. Okay, so next on the agenda are review, discussion of both the council procedures and finance policy versus council procedures. Um, it's customary to review the policy for the beginning of each calendar year. The council review, the council did review and adopt updated council procedures at the October 9th council with resolution 1493. Um, given the recent review and updates, staff have no recommendations to council procedures. Um, this is a discussion period allowing individual councilors to bring up and discuss specific portions of the procedures for the procedures as a whole. I did receive some emails from uh, council members, um, Councillor Keller mentioned um, a social media um, policy. My apologies for not being back to the council for a while now. I wasn't quite sure um, if you were talking about, I guess, exactly how we were thinking that we implemented. <laughs> um, sorry, I don't know where it is from that copy. Council members should not criticize other council members or staff for acting on a decision with the council member does not agree. Um, there's just a couple of these incidences that it seems as though they're published on various social media platforms and not held to an ethics standard. <laughs> Councilman Keller, can you tell me what page you're on? Um, I'm on page six. six. Thank you. Discussion and decision making. Five point three A. Yep. That's something I had highlighted as well. Council members should not criticize other council members or staff for acting on a decision which the council member does not agree. So council members may, however, point out how their individual opinion differs from the majority. So I think um, in the in just looking over the last year, I can see where some council may have on, on social media did criticize others. Um, I well, I agree with you. I want to point out section five is council discussion of public meetings. And I think um, our city attorney would, and I know I'm not going to speak for him, but I thought we did maybe pose a question before to the attorney, and I could be wrong, that there still is the First Amendment freedom of speech. While I do not appreciate negative things on social media, I don't know that our documents can cover that. 
it's more of a decorum and ethics um, modeling to the community that we would hope to stand for, but I don't know that it is in, um, I don't think it violates section five of council decorum at public meetings. Unless, yeah, unless you consider social media a public meeting, I don't know. I, I guess I want to echo and what I mean. You do not have the freedom of speech to say anything that you wish as you hold this position. We are, freedom of speech is limited and I would have to do some research to find out the proper law term that explains this process, but we cannot say what it, whatever it is that we want to say. <clears throat> Council member, in this 5.3 council members should not criticize. It doesn't say shall not. Big difference. So I think maybe that's part of the challenge in <clears throat> looking at this. I mean, there's several areas where it could be underinterpreted. So that's maybe. That's something that we should all look at and change those four names <clears throat> if that's what council's wishes is. So to move forward, um, and even give an example, when Mayor Walker died, it said in the event the mayor is not able to, then the council president steps up, but then there's somewhere else in here that says the council can decide. And so that's when council decided to bring Mayor Tom back and overrode this because it was under interpretation. So I think there's several different areas in here where it can be held to interpretation, which um, Council Member Miller brought up with just a simple wording. So maybe it's something that Council would like to really look at in depth. Council Member Baker? I agree. and. If we look ahead at 7.2 or section seven, council relations and communications, 7.2 says council relations with one another in public meetings. Um, despite the diversity, we've chosen to serve in public office to preserve and protect and prevent the present the present and future of the community. Show how individuals with disparate points can find common ground and seek compromise designed to benefit the whole. And it goes on further in 7.3 and section eight to, to talk about um, the decorum that I think we're hoping for. Um, Council in 8.1, council members are encouraged to conduct themselves so as to bring credit upon the city as a whole and to set an example of good ethical conduct for citizens of the community. I could see we must constantly bear in mind these responsibilities. Uh, so it goes back to wording. So right. encouraged to conduct, it doesn't say it must, you must. I do think that this council has maybe gone through some growing pains because um, there, it is my understanding from League of Oregon Cities that some councils have a session, a, a session on how, what our procedures mean, how to work together and sort of work this out at the beginning of the year in a, a council procedural session. Um, I like a lot of the language in here and I s understand some of it. I think it, um, since we haven't had that work session or procedural session that, that maybe we didn't all read it similarly or follow it similarly. Um, 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 Mr. Um, Bellers, um, point, I think 7.3 section D 
where it states all outside communications that represent council members individual interests and opinions in you know, opposition to the council position must clearly indicate that the communication is not representative of the council's position and is the council member's personal opinion. I think that's where things fall under like that criticism like on social media and stuff because it's not it's a outside communication between constituents and it just needs to you're allowed to do things you just have to make sure that it's painfully clear that it is your opinion and not that you're you're not the council's or <laughs> even you're you're like you as a council member like you as a private person opinion because it, as a council member you're you're bound by other ethical and other constraints but not as a private person I think you just need to be, because it's already written here, you just need to be more obvious when making. And I wouldn't be opposed to in the future looking at making an entire like section about how to deal with social media appropriately, because mm -hmm. in like the internet and like other forms of that kind of communication, what kind of communication? Because like a lot of these are good in like theory, but with the way that information is transfer and gathering has changed, even in like the past couple of years, it's. This has been a hot topic at, um, at the OMA or the Mayor's Association Conference, the LLC Conference. It's been a real hot topic, and I know. Um, some cities, they have a lot of good information on the social media, and it's maybe something that we could look at to make a little bit more in depth, and then maybe change some of the wording. So, uh, because as the thing I've learned in the, um, lots of things in conferences, but the thing I've learned, a lot of people want to go back to say, they want to go down a soapbox and say what they feel because they said it's freedom of speech. However, as a public elected official, it's a little different. So you have to be really careful as a, an elected official to just get on your soapbox and say how you feel. So you're held to different standards. So I think maybe um, it sounds like this is something that we need to maybe a little bit more in depth, change some wording and have a, have a work session on it. It's an important piece. I know this piece has been referred to I can't count how many times over the last three years. So it, it is, I think it might benefit if council chooses to, to take some time and we can schedule a time. Everyone could go over it with a fine tooth comb and then we can all figure this out and come to an agreement. Council Member Baker? Just a point of information. And Marilyn um, might help me get the number of pages we have about. 180 page council procedure document on our web page um, that is appears to be a scanned documents. There is a section on social media mm -hmm. on that. And I don't know, uh, I think it's called, it's called the council packet, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the all goblin mm -hmm. right at the beginning of your. So we have mm -hmm. that as well. Mm -hmm. And we might want to look at that. I'm not sure how we visit it, how that is so. And there's a huge section on ethics, mostly financial ethics in that packet as well. Um, and it's it's available online too if you click it. It would be great if it was searchable, um, you know, like we could look for a word. But um, nonetheless, you can scan through and you'll find the social media section too to look at what's already there. Yeah, I don't think I'm carrying that. So how does council feel about having a work session? Are they are you good with it the way it sits right now? Or what are your thoughts on it? I need to read the, the portion. I think that we need to just talk about I, I think that at the moment we're probably like there's more important things that deserve our attention. Um 
in work sessions and other things, but we should definitely plan on a less full schedule. <coughs> Our schedule is not as busy with things, revisiting something like this, putting it on a list of our back burner right? things that we need to deal with. Because I know that we have council goals and plan coming up and what we want to do and making sure that we are actively doing those and not just every new thing that pops up. Right. In a weekly thing, having something that's like, oh, this is good to talk about, but is it on our list of goals? No, then maybe we should push it to another another time. But if there was a time um, that you go through it, you could send your concerns, like if it has to do with specific wording or something like that, you could send them to Jordan, that could streamline oh, it. Yes, I agree that we should have something like that and we can do yes. that from now till whenever that time actually because mm -hmm. I do think this is a really important piece that's referred to quite often. Council Member Farrell, you had a question? Um, well, two things. Um, one, I think it would be a great thing to do um, every two years with new council members. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I know it's very overwhelming when you first become a council person. So um, I think that would be a good time to do it every two years. Um, and then I did email Jordan about that two to three meeting preliminary agenda on page five of 18. I think he printed out my email from all you guys, because I don't know what that means. That was the only thing that I found. So on page five of 18 under 4.2 agenda preparation, city administrator and mayor maintain a two to three meeting preliminary agenda. Does anyone know what that means? I asked City Recorder Woosley, who's been here 29 years, and she doesn't even know what the intent of that sentence is. Oh. The only thing, only thing we can think of is maybe to prevent these meetings where they're huge agendas. Mm -hmm. If we can table it to a meeting and even it out, that's the only thing I can think of. But that's a good point. That was the only thing I found. Yeah. Oh, and then the um refer to take out the manager on a city manager. Yeah, and change it. Yeah, we can do that apparently we do not have the reboot on. So yeah, and those are the only two things I found. Mm -hmm. So does that sound oh I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just as I read it, I think it means an agenda into the future. Like, we can talk yeah. about this in February and this in March. And is that what you probably yes. just said? Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and staff has right. the whole year built out. Yeah. On yeah. that note, how does the council get something on the agenda? The city council? The mayor gets it. Either the mayor does it or it's council consensus that it goes on the agenda. And when would a councilor bring up something to seek council? Consensus at the final at any time during this meeting. Closing comments or no, it would be any time. I mean, you guys have done it throughout a meeting. Okay. The faculty council consensus. So did all council members have the opportunity to go through it and send Jordan any changes or concerns? So would you like the opportunity to be able to send him? Yes. Okay. So it sounds like council's gonna next couple of weeks. Send we'll you. Compile the list. Okay. And uh, prior to our next council meeting, when do we or we don't give us a date that you'd like these by? Um, I don't. I said it's not as councilor Compton said it's not high on the list, but something we do need to address at some point. Council is concerned about it. Okay. Try and like said to the next couple of weeks have an opportunity and tonight council member Farrell you does that sound reasonable? Okay. All right. Any other comments or anything about council procedures review? 
Right, now we're going to go into finance policy review and um, does Tiffany approve it? Uh, so again, it's customary to review policies at the beginning of each calendar year. Council performed a brief review of the financial policy and staff recommendations at the October 9th council meeting. Council decided to wait until a clear current financial review was presented. Uh, financial statements through October had been presented. Our contracted CFO has been focused on preparing materials for the 21-22 financial audit. Financial statements for November and December are planned to be available for review at the January 22nd um, meeting. That is still on track that it will be available for the 22nd meeting. Um, the discussion period, uh, this discussion period will offer individual council members to bring up and discuss specific portions or the public as a whole. Um, so the draft changes by staff did not change uh, since October. Um, section five, increased staff expenditure limits that will not hinder day-to-day -day operations. That's 1,000 for department heads up to 10,000, 2,500 for city administrator up to 25,000. And these are all items that were, were within budget um, materials. Conduit wiring for electric department, firing, firing new tires for uh, the trucks. Um, council approval on all purchases over $25,000 outside of an approved formal contract. An um, example of that would be um, the wastewater project. We did contractor payments requests of a quarter of a million dollars, which is already approved through contract, through grant funding from the state. Um, so not needing to get that approved again through council each individual time. Um, which we already do, I just want to put that in wording in the document. Um, all purchase orders are required, purchase orders are required for all capital outlay, asset improvement purchases outside an approved formal contract. Again, um, wastewater plant is a capital improvement, but it was approved contract. Uh, three written bids will only be required for purchases over $25,000. Um, right now, I believe it's $2,500 which is not that much. Uh, section 14, operating expenses over 25,000 will require three written bids. City administrator may request written bids under 25,000. Section 15, requirement to contract with CAD um, increases from 10,000 to 100,000. Okay, council can approach this discussion in any way they see fit. Okay, that, now it's Tiffany. Let's approve it. Okay, so um, I have concerns, which I've expressed before. Um, to me, basically, this is giving the department heads $25,000 annually because if we give city administrator the $25,000 spending limit, then if the department heads go to the city councilor for something that's over $10,000. But under the $25,000, then so you're basically just raising everybody's levels to $25,000. Yeah. So to me, $25,000 should just be for emergencies and for not day to day operation. Uh, not saying that there would be misuse of funds, but this is a small town with narrow cash budgets in the margin. It's been mentioned several times tonight in other discussions. Uh, when you give this much, authority to the city administrator and the department heads, you're losing the control of how the money is being spent. Um, I would, as a citizen, would prefer that the spending limits be, you know, $2,500 to $5,000 for department heads and maybe $5,000. I don't know. I'd be willing to go as far as $10,000 for the, for the city administrator. Um, and then in section 14, uh, the council it talks all the time about lightening the city administrator's load. Um, to me, moving the maquette increase from ten thousand to a hundred thousand dollars, meaning that the the city administrator will be responsible for anything up to a hundred thousand dollars before uh, turning that over to maquette. And there's with grants, grants are so 
tedious and so minuscule in how that they can be handled and how the, the money is supposed to be spent. You have uh, this, by doing this to me, it seems like you're going to add a lot, of, uh, a bigger load to to the city and manager, uh, administrator uh, by having to meet grant deadlines and uh, being specific on the wage rate amounts according to the Davis-Bacon Act. Um, to me, it doesn't seem like a good idea because one tiny misstep can cost us a lot in the future, especially on grants. So um, I would ask that you consider that amount for the head. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I have a comment for Mr. Jim. Okay. Uh, with safeguards, I would not object an official written city emergency declaration procedures and policy established. One which explains everything before a cent is taken from the Treasury, financial officer involvement, and sign off a public disclosure at the following council meeting, along with public notice as required. I believe that may waste the concerns of the taxpayers or city or our taxpayers of our city. This council manages for us. Yeah. It also safeguards against abuse. Thank you for your time. Council member happy. I don't know. He signed it off at about 8 20. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Just check. Okay. Council member Baker. Um, thank you. I gorgeous. I do believe we had a work session about possibly um, some of the expenditure and authorization levels previously. Um, and you shared that some other cities had were up to twenty five thousand or fifteen thousand. There are some that are up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars as long as it's approved in the budget. Um, right. And I didn't know during that time if um, the the folks, the counselors at that work session had talked about maybe fifteen thousand per occurrence. I know that we had a truck breakdown or something that was, how much was it to repair the truck? 10,000. 10,000. So in, we needed it to be done quickly. So we didn't want to wait till a meeting. So I am for increasing the uh, amount that the department heads and city administrator can um, authorize. And I'd love if you had those numbers from other cities again for us to understand. And if you felt that you wanted to explain the section on the grants, I too felt like, oh no, we're <laughs> putting it on the city. What is the benefit of our administering grants up to $100,000? At least from my point of view, I think we actually less paperwork getting the CAD involved for these small grants. I mean, the DLC grant we just got for $45,000. Any, any grant that small is minimal. I mean, when we talk about breaking Davis wages, we're talking about multi million dollar grants from the federal government, not, not a $25,000 grant, $25, grant from the state tourism department. Mm -hmm. So you're feeling that the workload wouldn't be no. increased no. up to 100000 and not to a point where we detriment. And what is the benefit though? We're not giving money to the kid? Yeah, you know, why why the decision in the first place? To I just that the ten thousand seems a little it's really a bother with bringing the kid into the into the grant. Did I hear you say they're asking for more paperwork because of it bringing them in? It causes you a lot more paperwork? Yes, yeah. We would be entertaining the kid for the service. So it costs money. Yes, correct. Anytime they administer a grant, we pay for it. Okay. And they don't have a policy that belonging to them, we have to let them administer grants up to. But if you felt like there was a grant that you needed more expertise or. The, oh, yeah. If, even if it was like 80, under the 100,000, but if it was something that you. Felt like you needed more information, you could still. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, should we write that in the grant policy unless determined? Yeah, we, we can put that language in there. That, you know, that who determines the city administrator determines that yeah, I would say. assistance would be beneficial. I would like that caveat put in there. Absolutely. Sensitive. 
started talking about these like caps on expenditures. Have we has the department heads and signature like seen anything that was probably like under the 2500 or more than the 2500 that needed to happen now but wasn't a and didn't go before council because it needed to happen for a daily operation I know one on the top of my head. Um, the, the most pressing one was the shark repair. That was a couple months ago. We had a rash of entire each tire for those things was a couple like probably thousand. Yeah, months. they're they're just get the set replaced. Yeah. Thanks, Member Miller. But all of those could be taken care of with an emergency clause and. A notification to council at its next meeting without having to raise. Well, because we have to, they have to ask us permission and then we have to approve it. If they have an emergency like a truck straight down to where they need it fixed right now, they can go ahead and order that and then bring that to council for an approval. It's just an emergency clause for certain situations like that. And not day to day stuff. Yeah. But I mean, like day to day operations, like, yeah. I feel 2000 for day to day operations is mm -hmm. way too small. So, for example, we're getting close to the point of needing to order a more conduit for the electric department. A single school of conduit, or, or yeah, conduit is $8,000. That is the material we need to operate. Our electric department. Do you does council want that brought to them in a meeting just so we can do our job? Council Member Keller, did you hand up first? Uh -huh. Um, just to like talk in terms of what twenty five hundred dollars really is. When I was the head softball coach at Hood River Valley High School, I routinely wrote, wrote purchase orders in the thousand dollar to twenty five hundred dollar range. Just for softball equipment, like protective netting, game balls, like, and, and to save on the wear work, you would put all of this into a single purchase order. Uniforms, I mean, I, sweatshirts, like just basic items within an athletic program. And like, like stuff costs a hell of money. We hear, Mr. or Chief Logan talked about how expensive fire equipment here is. Like he needs that opportunity to purchase this, these items. They're budgeted. We sit through a budget. We discuss each line item. It's there. We have questions about that. There are checks and balances put in place. We need to keep up with the cost of goods and wasting time here willy-nilly about various financial aspects in purchasers. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Miller, I lost some thought process oh, there. Sorry. All right, Councilmember Baker. Um, thank you, Councilman Keller. I am reminded of something at one of the conferences of LOC. We said the number one way we can work with staff is to make their jobs easier and let them do their jobs um, instead of trying to control every little part of their jobs. And I know in our work session, you came up with reasons for these numbers and shared other cities um, limits. And that's why they're not shocking to me. Uh, and even though at that time, some folks were talking about 15,000 instead of 25. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, the council's goal is to make policy, not to make daily decisions. If we're if we become the daily decision, like whether or not somebody purchases them, like that's not the council's job. We should be making the policies that when a purchase that matters and might need to unbalance the budget, we make sure that those either happen or don't. 
and we can plan for them, not something that's not like if we're budgeting these things and they're within the department's budget, we shouldn't be involving ourselves in the daily life, like activity. So I'm, I'm for increasing it. I don't know if 25,000 is the number we should go for, but like that, like we can raise it to everything to 10,000 and see if that causes any pains. And then that might be our news point for a while. And then if we get a bunch of things that are 15,000 and we're like, well, now we're doing this all the time, maybe we, at that point, increase it again. I know it's more false, like, it gets, we have to change it more times, but we also don't want to change it to $100,000 and have a department accidentally spend all of their money that they have accidentally. So from the October 9th work session, I, I was not in attendance to that. So these numbers were from that work session? At least. So it was in a council meeting. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And we were going to wait until we got more caught up on our Yeah, that's time when I had received any financial guidance. Right. Okay. Have we gotten our audit yet? Yeah. So we're on. I too am for increasing them to at least 10,000 and possibly more. And um, I do like the idea of an emergency clause in case there's something even bigger than 10,000. Like, I don't know, you would know what those kinds of things are. Um, such as Well, I mean, the biggest thing would be, you know, in the snowstorm this weekend, the power lines along. Um, out at the South Bank right now, and we get we call it in, and it's seven grand. Like, I gotta pay that. It's, That's what it was, wasn't it? 70,000. That was the very call last year was 70 grand. Yeah, yeah. like four days and 70 grand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm also in favor of the emergency call, so don't get me wrong. I just we have to raise our bottom from the floor to somewhere at least at waist level. <laughs> And probably building an emergency plan so our city administrator isn't violating our policies. So he can spend that 70000 to fix the down wires. So would it be consensus to add an emergency clause? Yes. Okay. What about increasing? And then what about the expenditure level from a thousand to ten thousand department heads. That's good. Okay. I don't have any problem with department heads, but the department heads we have now are very educated and know their departments, mm -hmm. and they're not going to like go take the money and short themselves on something else later in the year. No, I just I totally trust them. And I'll be honest, I don't remember who said it now, but I'm going to prove it. If they come with me with something that's fifteen grand, ninety nine percent of the time I'm going to probably approve. So what about the twenty five hundred to twenty five thousand for returns for city administrator? I, I feel like um, the numbers we should probably put them in an action item in a motion because right now we're in a discussion technically and like mm -hmm. having a, yeah. oh making change, putting the numbers for an action item for. Enough to be yeah, that would be a, a, an action item to vote on. With okay. Yeah. Draft. yeah, we're good. 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 Yes, it is. So let's go back to the emergency clause, right? Um, and to change the from a thousand to ten thousand per occurrence for department heads. Good that everyone's good with that. Uh, then to change from 2,500 to 2,500 per occurrence for city administrator. It's been the same day, 2,500 to 2,500. 25,000. It's been a long day. <laughs> Jordan, if there's some concern about that amount, it's 15,000 going to cramp your ability too much? 20? No. No. There are some over that, but most purchases are under that. 
Yes. Yeah. So what you're saying is twenty five thousand recoverable. Per inch. So we did we put in the LED light bulbs. We bought a, a pallet of fifty, and that was sixteen thousand dollars. There's a budget item in there to do, but it's sixteen thousand dollars. And and the check and balance is in our our financial report. So we yes. have to check it out. This is with the other check and check. So is council okay with the twenty five thousand? Okay. So that's on budgeted items day to day. That's not like, and I don't mean any disrespect, but that's not like, oh, I want a new TV for my office. I'm going to. Oh, correct. Right. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> no, I know, but no. I'm just trying to clarify what the increase. Right. What I think for my bulbs is a good example. Of how the light bulbs are covered, and then you yeah, it was a council goal item, and it was in right in with that budget. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, any other? I mean, the, the changes are in red. All non budgeted items should come before council and be a council decision, anyway, right? Correct. Yeah. So yeah, we're, that's what I'm trying to work on. This, this is more for like a maybe we can add a clause in there where if it's a number above a certain amount that we get told about it. Yeah. Expl explicitly, but not buried in a receipt page. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you guys want to report any person over five grand or whatever number you want to set that would be. Um, and then the only other thing I, I did talk to Jordan about was I know we going through the red taking finance officer out and we're not sure yet if we're going to have a finance officer and it just seemed like well it's gonna red light it all out and then perhaps we're gonna have to red light it all back in. Um I mean I don't have any problem doing that, but it I don't yeah. think we really need to do that now or not. And that's why I did finance department. Yeah, because we don't have a finance. Department. Yeah, I don't now. Yeah. yeah. Well, so it could. So be. everyone's good with finance department for now. So okay. I know it's a little vague. It's, it's not great. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then department heads have the authority in the department. So yeah. a finance officer would be is probably the department head of finance Correct. department. Yeah, so okay, it okay. kind of consolidates itself. Yeah. That's all I saw. All right. So to go over it once again, add an emergency clause. Everyone's okay with the ten thousand per occurrence for department heads. Twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand for occurrence for city administrator. And then what was there was one more. Um, McHead. 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 can't ask for grants. Yeah. I can help if he wants to. I would, I would like in there to have like a notification clause of of amounts more than yeah eight thousand ten ten thousand eight eight thousand something high on a department head budget but not like we're not get, picking up every little thing they buy but maybe like the things that are close or the things that hit their max budget on expenditure or like those kind of things but. Eight How does the council feel about extra notifications? What does that mean? What does that look like? What is an well, extra? We need a report that just says, and like specifically, we the said. department spent on one expenditure eight thousand eight thousand five hundred on one on this item. Would that be in the city minister report? Yeah, I yeah. am supposed to do my report. Okay. I don't 
47 now. Anything that requires going beyond the department head, but not quite to council's level. So that 10 to 25 range would just be listed in my report. Thank that. you. Yeah. I like that. It could just be the second. Because, like, like, some of those big things, like, if you're not pouring over the receipts page, you might miss them. Okay. And, like, some of those big things would be nice to know what we spent a large amount of money on. Like a heads up. Yeah. yeah. It's just a heads up. It's not okay. necessarily asking for permission to okay. telling us about the large okay. expenditures. Is there, is there any other? There should be one. Is there any other um, comments? Questions. Does that sound clear as mud or is it clear? Yeah. <laughs> well, first, I thought we made it. Yeah. All right. Well, hallelujah. Are you going to address the new editing? We did. I think we did. We did. We did. We did. We did. We did. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We just added that piece. Of okay. We got through that. Okay. City Administrator Bennett Report. All right, mine is a little long winded this time around. I uh, gave a half year update on council goals for the year. Um, so I can read it. I can read it if council wants or specific questions. I'm doing it. Council, would they like to read it? Or? It's, it's long. I read it. I read it all. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, it was very detailed. I appreciate it. Yes. Any questions, comments, Council Member Baker? Yes. So um, under the staff retention and recruitment plan, I um, did have discussion with City Administrator Bennett, and I did reach out to League of Oregon Cities about could they help us um, some of this work, uh, job descriptions, internal pay, equity market analysis, and they said no. And I said, okay, let me share with you because it's public information. What the um, yeah. HR answers estimate is, and they said, oh, we use HR answers. <laughs> and it's very important that you do some um, non-biased um, internal and market analysis for equity uh, and retention of your staff. And I asked if they could recommend any other further places that might budget, and they didn't know. Talk to Councilman, I mean, City Administrator Bennett about checking with Hood River um, County Human uh, Human Resources Department, since we are a part of Hood River County, if they can help us, but I don't know if you've had time. I don't know if McKed would help us do any of this. I just yeah. wondered if there's some organization we belong to that might also, I mean, can we get bids i guess I, I, I have reached out to two other companies for quotes um i received one over the weekend i don't remember what the total was and then i have a, a meeting with another firm tomorrow so i'm getting okay. more quotes okay. uh, but based off this amount um unless we get closer to the end of the budget this is not happening until next budget cycle okay. so i mean i would love to get it done before but it's it's not gonna, probably not gonna happen yeah. But you're a research engineer. Yes, so I can put it, build it into the budget. And I, I appreciate your um, wisdom after speaking to LOC as well that it does take a human resources specialist to make sure we are equitable. It reduces liability yeah. from employees. and um, Which, to be fair, it scares the crap out of me. Yeah, I, so I, yeah, somebody with a human resources degree is recommended by LOC. So then the wind song phase two, the tour. Um, I know you were going to look into setting up the oh. tour for council, right? Yeah, I totally spaced that one. I will. Okay. I don't think we want to do it. No, it's one or February. Yeah. So maybe March? Yeah. yeah. Is this, um, by March, they really should be done with roads should be put in. I mean, at the point where they're selling lots. I know there, um, I walked out there last weekend on the upper lots for the two or three homes, I think it is, or yeah. three homes. Um, there is some concern. They've got it's a rock routine and all that, like this is the boulders. And then they have graded the dirt this way and the rain, you can see the big crevices. And so the mud is just washing over the rocks 
and it's like a giant lake. They call it Lake Windsong. <laughs> so I, I, it's a concern. The residents there had a concern about it, and I'm not a geotech or anything. Well, yeah, we have, that, we have but, our engineers, and they have their geotech specialists. I mean, okay. they, they do, I don't know if it's weekly, but they do site inspections. Okay. They sign off and do everything. Okay. Okay. It looks just shaky. I'm not an engineer, but I mean, I'm like, that doesn't look good. We rely on their specialties. Yeah. All right. So, is there a way we can communicate to some of the owners, like the Howells concerns that that yes, a geotech came out yeah. or whatever that engineer? Yeah. I mean, if you want to talk to them, or they can reach out to me. Okay. Does yeah, that have a chance to get them? Okay. They're the same ones with the fire hydrant, the meter that's yeah. sticking out. So. Okay. Oh. Let me know who that is. All right, and I had the fire program and I just never talked to you. And I'll have to check that out tomorrow. Okay. And then do you want to talk about the America's phone days? Um, yeah, so I got a quote and to be on it a little more expensive than I thought it would be. Um, this would allow city council to have a uh, phone system like we have for public works and um, electric department, you would download uh, the go-to meeting app on your phone. They would call, the, any community member would call the number published. It would show up through your phone as a call through the app, not your regular phone uh, program. And then you would call them back through that app as well and it would just say City of Cascade Locks. So your personal phone number would not be out to share with the trust. And that would be 156 a month for all counselors and mayor. Correct. Yep. We're all seven with a initial setup fee of 495. It's mm -hmm. considerably less than having individual phone lines. You know, a different. Yes. Yeah, so actually paying month. for itself. Yes. Right. I know the port um, commissioners, they have a port cell phone, there, but they also received a grant to help get the cell phones and whatnot. We don't have a grant. So I, don't, I know it does present challenges to have when you're an elected official and to have your personal number out. And I know uh, council member Happy, he's um, off, but I know he has expressed concerns uh, over a few meetings about having some way for a phone system. So that's why we looked into it too. Yeah. Okay. You're done. You can move this to another meeting for an official vote. Okay. But this is just for a discussion. Okay. And what budget would that come under? Uh, probably. <laughs> Um, electrical, no. no. Kidding. <laughs> I have been a long day. To be honest, I'm not 100% sure where it would fit best. Okay. It'd probably be administrative cost, uh, but I'd have to see exactly which one. Okay. All right. Would council be open to further discussion on this? And I don't know. I don't find it necessary for me, but if someone else is having problems with it, they can do it. Um, I mean, my thought is if the constituents would want this to happen, then I'm all for it. And if not, then I think the system as it is is fine. But at the same time, I don't know what everybody, like, with the city of Cascade Lots constituents as a whole want to be able to call any of us and then have us return their call because it because it would be a return call it wouldn't be a I know mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, cities and their uh, elected officials use some type of phone system to where they, they get them off of using their personal phone. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I I wouldn't want to use my own phone mm -hmm. number, and that like even. That it would be your own, like a completely separate phone in case somehow you yeah. accidentally call somebody back with your own phone numbers and you don't have to change yeah. numbers. But that's that's a time attack thing. But at the same time, I don't see a need unless the people want to be able to talk to their 
elected officials a little easier because I know emailing is one thing and I'm granted really bad at looking at emails. I, I'm not 100% sure how this would affect freedom of information requests and if your phone could be seized for that request. I'm not 100% sure. Is there any data saved? I don't know. That's why I, I think it'll be through the cloud for go to meeting, but I'm not 100% sure. Freedom of information is about written and recorded things with a phone call longer. I think it, the fact I, that you the call log the call, the call log, log would, but not necessarily <laughs> need to have every single conversation recorded. Councilmember Baker, uh, personally, I I do find that any communication I do uh, would be email. I mean, I'm not my phone number's out there anyway, but um, but I could see that the mayor could benefit from this. I don't know if there could be lesser if other people. Well, well there have been incidences where um, there was a couple um, members of the community who got a hold of my phone number and they literally called me 18 times one right. day and I finally I, I blocked them then they got their friend's number and they called me and I mean it's times like that I don't I would rather not have my it's my personal phone so I'd rather not have my personal number that's why I think the mayor should have you're a separate city phone. Right. That and that's just one incident last year. There were probably few. less than $150 a month or less. And any counselor who feels that that's a way they want to communicate, I don't know. Or you're right. How do we find out from the constituents? Chief will um, Are you people, the, the only city staff that really uses this app? Mm -hmm. um, so anything that goes through the app is also on my phone. So when I delete the app, if I delete the app, it's no longer on the phone. It's all saved on my desk phone. And so it rings my work phone through the app that says my desk phone is calling me. And I answer on to the app. And then when I call them back to the app, it says that it's coming from the fire station mm -hmm. and not any phone, it, just that phone number. Right. If anybody wants to look at the app, um, I have my phone with me. Okay. Take a look. Maybe I use it all the time. So this is an app and not a phone. So we don't we don't have to be paying for phones. Right. So you pay the app, you download it to your personal phone, and then whatever number is set up for for you, it would ring the app on your phone and not your personal. You pay phone. for that app. It's this app. It's this app. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. So, so the, the, the council can move forward to essentially have a virtual phone. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have an actual like physical desk phone to be in the cloud. And then the way you use it is the app on your person's phone. Okay. Council Member Keller? Uh, the school district has the, a similar app, mm -hmm. and we use it extensively during online school. And when I just like Chief Logan said, if I used it to call a parent, it said it came from the high school. And it wasn't from my personal device. I secondly, um, I feel like I did a quick search um, on grants. We can do a grant for this. I don't think we need to do an expenditure. And I would be willing to research and try and figure this out. This okay. shouldn't come out of the budget. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other discussion on it? It's nine thirty-five almost. I got one more thing in my report. Okay. Not, I did email about joint work sessions. Yes. Um, the planning commission is good to meet this Thursday, the 11th at 7 for joint work session. And I got a text from Janice. The tourism committee um, can't do the 16th, but they can do the 29th. So three weeks from today. And from the weather app, it's going to be nasty on Thursday here. And Friday and Saturday. And Friday and Saturday and Sunday and Monday. Mm -hmm. We're down to like in the teens. Yeah. And with precipitation. Well, so, so. <laughs> don't say that. Uh, that's what what it is. Right. So. Yes. Council Member Keller. Um, again, coming from an athletic experience, I would say don't ever cancel cancel a meeting or anything until you have to. Like, okay. plan on it going. Perfect. If you need to cancel it, cancel. So, 
The 29th, what time would that be? It's a Monday night. 6 p.m. 6 p.m., a joint work session. And are we, okay, then we do joint goal setting or does this council think about goal setting first or is, I don't know. But I guess this one's more kind of an introduction. Okay. Um, and I think there's maybe I'm wrong. Seems to be confusion on roles and responsibilities between council and the committees. Mm -hmm. So make sure everybody's on the same page moving forward. Okay. But again, like, like you mentioned that yes, council is ultimately in charge of setting priorities. But I, wanna make, I, I guess I want to make sure council and the committees are on the same page. Nobody's going to vote. Right. No road. No. Can I just clarify? Uh, so it's seven o'clock on Thursday the 11th yes. and six o'clock on Monday the 29th. Correct. Unless there's any major objection. I know um, Captain Compton probably can't be here at six. Planning on the 11th? It'll be tight. Okay. Right? Yep. And tourism? Yes, both committees are good with it. Okay, perfect. And we'll be in here, so if the weather's bad, will we try to Zoom some folks or let you know? Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be virtual. Yeah, we'll right. have virtual access. Yeah. Just walk. Just walk. I can come. So, yeah, I'm just thinking other folks. I feel like we walk. We only yeah. have this going to be an issue for a so. And, yeah, it's an issue. Well, let's, let's, let's uh, play it by ear and see how it goes otherwise. Yeah. Take any other... Oh, yeah. Okay. Moving on to mayor and city council comments. Okay, council member Miller, sir. Uh, I did have my first in the said meeting. And well, I spent most of it catching up on on their procedures. And so we have an introductory meeting for myself. I didn't make the uh, uh, small cities meeting due to, I wasn't too much pain with my sciatica. But I, I like to thank staff for all their hard work and Dr. Scar and Chair Spear and Director Madsen for being here. And John, for your good report, Tiffany and Courtney, for your, your appearances here. Thank you all for that. And that's it. Yeah, we want an order. You are going in order. We're going around. Um, I had asked our city administrator um, about a topic that was in the minutes from December 11th. Um, the, the paragraph that reads in the minutes. C.M. Baker said an individual on the budget committee had brought up the clarification of resolution 1487 and ordinance 457. She asked if that could be brought up to the attorney again. And it was my understanding that that has to be a consensus of counsel to, Correct. to yep. do that. So I don't know if we wanted to continue with the consensus on that to, I mean, I don't think it would hurt to have the attorney take a one more look at that, but um, so I'm bringing that up. Does anyone have a need to have the attorney look at it some more? Or? Well, the issue was the issue was why the public doesn't have access. Right. That. that was the issue. That was what I brought up. Was that I asked for a copy of that document and I was denied because I client. Um, privilege, but we are the client established for that issue. So, okay. right. I don't see any reason one way or the other. Well, when I brought it up, I was thinking of a clarification, but if the attorney claims it's client privilege, I don't want to challenge that. I, I don't know. But he, the attorney said it's client privilege. I don't want to stop him. Let me do that. Okay. I'm the one paying it. I'm the client. Yes. Okay. What else comments? Um, I forgot what else I was going to say. 
Well, I want to thank everyone for their presentations today. I learned some, mm -hmm. some good stuff. Um, and then I was just going to add um, to a personal note that I am taking Drive January to a new level and I'm off Facebook too. So you guys can either, you got my phone numbers and city email, so you can reach me that way if something comes up. That's all I got. I can throw a rock that far. Councilmember <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Member Baker. Um, I, as usual, thank you to Mount Happy Community College. I'd like to understand more about our districting and maybe in this next year, I'll look into that. Um, thank you to staff for all that you do. Thank you, Administrator Bennett, for the, <clears throat> your detailed reports and your uh, flexibility in thinking as we uh, modify the electrical um, work coming toward the port. Um, and thank you everyone for our um, discussions about the lobbyist and, and hopefully we'll get some good benefit from that and learn how to work with this. I do want to point out in our procedures still, and I appreciate so much um, everything that the fire department is doing and, and your reports are fabulous. It is part of our procedures that every committee should give an oral written report at each meeting. And I love that, even if they said we didn't meet and we're, we're gonna do our full setting next month. Just a quick thing to Mr. Bennett. So we knew what planning was doing and we knew what tourism was doing it's in our documents currently. And I would love to continue to do that. Great, I'm so excited about our joint meetings because I've been hoping for that for a year so that the planning and tourism and any that's all we have right now. Can, well, our architectural review committee, I don't know that that's we have other committees that aren't full yet. Um, and I did appreciate so much working with budget committee and even having that first meeting on how we're going to work together. And I thought that, that was really, really fabulous and instructional, and I hope we'll do that in these joint work sessions. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, it came up last um, time we met in December that we had a legal question that held up a vote. And it was basically just a question that none of us could answer at the moment. And I did call legal work and cities about that issue. And they said it is appropriate to take a small recess or to have us to take, make a point of information, clarification, we don't know the answer and have a staff member take five minutes to research it or attend recess. And I wondered if we're paying our attorney a stipend, is it possible to ask him to be available, not here, not on Zoom, to be available during our twice a month council meetings? And I presume he keeps track of his time, right? To, yes. For that stipend. And he might give us a suggestion. I know people who are on call often charge a minimum of, minimum of half hour, minimum of 15 minutes or whatever, that if we could ask our attorney to possibly be on call during our sessions, <laughs> our, during our council meetings as part of their, his stipend and what would he charge, what would be the minimum? Uh, he may not know the answer off the top of his head. He, that would be the answer and charge us for 15 minutes. I don't know, I'm gonna need to research this for an hour or whatever. So that's one thing, if this council, uh, is this something we need to vote on? Do we have consensus? If we want to ask our attorney that question? No, he's on the and council it's like a expense. Pardon? I mean, it's to ask someone to be, a, some of our meetings are here, we're at 10 o'clock, we would ask them to be available for yeah. probably yeah. three well, hours. Well, he, could, he could give us a time limit. I'm available between here and here, because our action items are usually earlier. Mostly, I felt that we we postponed an important vote that could have cost us some legislative relationships due to not knowing an answer. I don't, do, all we can do is ask him, what would he charge? What would be the minimum charge? Because if I had a person, if I had an attorney on stipend, I would want them available by phone call or text if um, twice a month I had a meeting, I would say, hey, Joe, I need you. Anyway, anybody else see the, any value in that? I think it's such a rare idea that it wouldn't be. Okay, worth well, it. I, I would like us to consider that we can ask for point of clarification, point of information, 
take a recess and see if staff can answer questions to move ahead. Five minute recess. Um, and on that note, um, I have been looking up point of personal privilege is what we say, and we League of Oregon Cities consultants said that we can say it shortly after any disparaging remark against our reputation or our person has been shared in this room by a fellow council member or someone in the audience. So we can, and the mayor would recognize us. And point of information or clarification, apparently we raise our hand when we're not understanding something that somebody has said, or we want to clarify the fact or the source of that information. You know, can you provide the fact where that came from? So that is two things, as well as thank you. Um, a second, apparently, to second a motion doesn't mean you're going to vote for it or that you like it. It means it's open for discussion. And the person who seconded doesn't have to vote for that. The person who made the motion either usually votes for that or um, or they withdraw it. And those were things that I wanted to point out from Robert's roles that I also conferred with League of Oregon Cities. And um, thank you. I do think I've learned a lot in this year. I hope you all have. I feel like we're becoming a cohesive council that with diverse opinions, and I like that. And on this issue of speaking with respect and decorum in and out of this room, I have been to enough conferences now that I know there's no amount of words we can write that will make that happen. It's, it has to be an agreement, mutual respect, and our own self-regulation. And I know that some councils, when they have their work session, like you said, the biennial work session on how we're gonna to work together, they actually sign okay. that we are going to speak respectfully, even if we disagree. And sometimes it's posted, these rules of decorum for public speakers as well. And brought that up. So that's just something I hope that we all take to our heart um, in 2024, even as we have diverse opinions, that we speak respectfully of one another. So thank you. Um, well, a huge shout out to Chief Logan and his fire department. They are incredible stewards of our community and leaders within our community. Um, just as an FYI, the high school raised roughly $24,000. Oh, it's twenty-four thousand dollars and some change for the fish food bank during their their camp food drive. Um, I don't know what was contributed locally, as a lot of the donations were anonymous, but it was an incredible display of support for those in need in our community. Thank you. That's incredible. Councilmember Well, I just want to thank everybody who came and gave reports and spoke. So they were good and informational, and your opinions are always valued. Um, I had something I wanted to bring up in the, to put on the agenda for, it's not important, but it's something I think we should think about, and it's something I did a little research on, not super in-depth, but the city has no way of knowing or tracking what businesses reside in our city. We don't have a licensing at, at all or any kind of thing to even like know, no one, you can't ask like, hey, what businesses do we even have? Like you can't ask city, what businesses do you have here? I, I was thinking about making a blah, blah, blah business and I wanted to see if I had any competition. We can't give that information because we don't have it. Um, and I was thinking about making it as like a business licensing thing where we give, <clears throat> send out a notice to the public and then make it not expensive or really anything because we're just wanting it more for informational gathering than for like actually like 
So more like a database. More like a database. Like we can maybe do like a $5 fee. We can't do that. We can't do that. Without asking, we can ask the public if they want a $5 yes. fee for a licensing from businesses. It would have to be. Um, well, I know. I'm not saying that. That's why I'm saying that like, this is a future other thing. Like we can, at, as council right now, we can make it so that it's collect. We can make it requirement that they do it. We can do an ordinance. Yeah. Mandating it. Yeah. So that way we could find out who's doing business in commercial or in residential areas when they're not supposed to. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Or doing any kind of business like we didn't we didn't know like that there was I didn't know that there was like four different cryptocurrency mining companies that are within the city and they all like they're some of them work together but like I've never heard of a city that didn't have like some sort of business licensing and like just as a database thing like it would be nice to be able to give to the future business association, like a list of people that they could contact if they asked for it. Like, oh, we're looking at making a business association. We want to ask the people who own and operate businesses in Cafe Box, who can I contact? Oh, we don't know. The closest thing we have is our commercial utility accounts. I mean, we can look at it that way, but that's but that's that not the same. It doesn't yeah. quite like you can run a business without necessarily triggering a commercial utility. Like running a internet business out of your home is not necessarily enough to sure. yeah. to trigger a commercial utility because you're not making could, more expenditure on the utility line. But it could be something maybe we look at another city who has some some type of um, program in place that. We can get some ideas. So, but definitely, yeah. okay, so we can talk further about it. And, and okay, I, I, will, I, I want right. I'm formally asking to put it on a future agenda. I don't know, it doesn't have to be anytime soon, but like so we should talk about it in a work session, maybe, or a put make an action item to create an ordinance. Okay. Would you like to look into other cities, research that, and see what cities have programs that would be effective? I'm pretty sure you could look at literally any city. I mean, I have never heard. Do you want? I'm asking. Yeah. If you want to research I, I, that? I'm that, going to research it okay. a little bit more, but That'd be it great. would be good to have more. That would be great if you could come up with some examples and maybe um, some cities that have got it down in their system that they have. That would be good. If you want to help with that, let me know. I, I think okay. it's a great idea. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I can do the city manager with serve email. Okay. Just Similar size cities that are really just use it for database collection, right? Not a revenue source. Yeah, and okay. It's like right now we don't want to promote the revenue. We can't we can't make it revenue and we don't really want to. But if the people in the future think that we need to, then there's at least a list out there. Right, right. Okay. Anything else? No. No. All right, uh, gosh, uh, first of all, Happy New Year, okay. everyone. Got through 2023, now we're on to 2024. Um, thank you to staff as well. Jordan, um, really detailed report, appreciate that. Um, uh, Mountain Community College, thank you to, for them to come out and present. Um, I like that they came out, it, it was an opportunity that maybe we could get some satellite programs out here. So um, I thought that was really good that they all three of them came out. Um, Chief Logan, thank you so much. You and your team, your staff, everybody who just, um, we we just couldn't do it with action. Appreciate all of you and your team so much. Thank you. Um, congratulations to all the committee, uh, new committee members. Um, welcome aboard. Um, Tess Melio, um, I appreciate her coming and answering questions. Um, Jordan and I did make the small cities meeting. It was very small. There was, it was very, very small, but, um, but it was still good. We, we showed up and we represented and there was what, two other people there. It wasn't very many. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But it was still positive. And so, um, it, good things came out of that. Um, thank you to council member Pete for, I know he's traveling and it's pretty sensitive to get through airports. And so, 
really appreciate him taking the time and being able to jump on in Zoom. Um, what else? And I just, I, I just want to um, encourage everyone to, you know, be respectful towards one another and let's get through this. Everyone, we're all volunteers. None of us are getting paid. Um, everyone's, I, I believe, is hurt. It's in the right place. Um, we don't do this for the big bucks. I, I get asked all the time, oh gosh, how much does that pay, Mayor? I said nothing. It doesn't, and neither does City Council. So um, I just really want to thank each and every one of you also for stepping up and serving your community. And I really, really appreciate it. And I know the constituents here as well. And then um, I'm sure we're set for any nasty weather that comes our way here in the next week or so. And um, happy new year and see everybody at the meeting on Thursday if it comes yeah. through. All right, you know, and we need to move to. Uh, we need a vote to adjourn. Motion. A motion. Excuse me. I motion to adjourn. I second. All right. Discussion. Roll call vote. Councilman Crompton. Aye. Councilman Baker. Aye. Farrell. Aye. Calvert. Aye. Miller. Aye. Mayor Bell. Aye. Passes and it's completely new here.